acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, October 16th, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, founder of Tarbell.org, author of Deadly Spin and Nation on the Take, reformed health insurance industry executive Wendell Potter, on Donald Trump's adoption of Obamacare. Meanwhile, Puerto Rico's healthcare infrastructure collapsing. As, ca- as casualties up to 43 dead and growing. Oral arguments in a federal court over the emolument suit start this week in New York. And our Iraqi troops trying to retake Kirkuk from the Kurds. Meanwhile, Trump's new National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration head, not a science guy, (laughs) but does have a huge conflict of interest. Then Chad stops fighting Boko Haram after Trump's travel ban. Kaepernick files a grievance against NFL owners. The Me Too hashtag trends in the wake of Harvey Weinstein. I guess just fall from grace, as it were. And Donald Trump treats Mike Pence like uh, like it's actually the dynamic from the President Show. All that and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, first, folks, uh, let me just start with, uh, I got an email from uh, <clears throat> Fred, formerly from Connecticut College, who is living in Seoul, Korea. And um, he created two Facebook groups, <clears throat> one being uh, the Majority Report International. So if you are an international listener of the Majority Report, uh, you can head over to that Facebook. And one is specifically for Korea, uh, which is also on Facebook. And we have both those links. And one of the things that's going to happen when we do get our new blog, and I, I guess I implied our new website, I guess I implied um, that it was going to be ready like a week ago. And um, I shouldn't have done that. It's close. We're, we're dangerously close. But we will have a page designed specifically for stuff like this, where if you're interested, hey, I want to get, go to a meetup, or what is that organization in Virginia that I can uh, get involved with, or is there a Facebook page for people who are listening to the program in Chad, let's say, uh, we will place all of that in uh, a specific section of the website. So don't necessarily send us the links now, but get them ready. Get them ready. 
And um, we have a full complement of people in the uh, studio today. The majority report uh, juggernaut just <laughs> really is like we're in full capacity. Uh, Matt is here. Michael is back from his um, weekly vacation. Uh, soon, it was an soon educational to go experience. I'm sure. The I'm next, sure. then in about a week, a, a little over a week, though. You don't need to uh, say. Just it's much better when you spring on us. <coughs> uh, <coughs> of course, uh, Brendan is here. Yeah, right. Uh, he's already getting cold. Uh, Brendan is here, as is Jamie. And uh, I should say, it reminds me. Are you hiring? Do you know where to uh, post your job to get the best candidates? Well, ask yourself, what if hiring could be easier, more streamlined, less time consuming? So even when you're busy, you could still be smart about the way you hire. If you're hiring, you know that quality hires keep your business moving forward. But you also know it can take a lot of time to find the right candidate. I know all of this, folks, but I wised up. And I used ZipRecruiter for the last uh, round of hiring and uh, sitting on our couch right now. Brendan is uh, Brendan. Why don't you tell folks uh, how uh, how uh, you came to this program? Folks, if you're sitting on your couch in your apartment, get on ZipRecruiter right now. <laughs> wow. Look at that. They got a great one. Selling it. Apply deal. And if you tell them about our deal. <laughs> <laughs> we actually did uh, find Brendan through ZipRecruiter and I'll tell you why, how that happened I don't know how he found it but I do know that with ZipRecruiter you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards then ZipRecruiter puts its smart technology to work it basically matches stuff up against uh, what you're looking for from what people present themselves as in uh, on these job sites and it works. It wasn't. I, 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 it was a hard choice. Honestly, the hires were. I had over a hundred and fifty candidates for these two jobs. Yeah, and many of whom I dub I put just in the um, next time Michael takes a vacation column. Oh, so that's pretty soon. Hmm. 80% of employers who post ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. I had multiple quality candidates through the site in one day. Do you like research? Do you hate Jimmy Dua? <laughs> and the best part, I didn't have to juggle any emails, no calls to the office. We don't even have a phone here. Simply screen, rate, and manage all candidates in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire Brendan Made a point of saying that we have a deal, and we do. Right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. One more time, try it for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. You know what I say. The best time to look for somebody to hire is when you don't need anybody. And folks, uh, my uh, diet with uh, Nikki is over. I did not win. But um, the one thing that we did not, neither one of us gave up over the whole um, month that we had a, a diet competition. I sort of tried to re, reinvigorate it from what I did with Break Room Lab with Marin. Didn't work out as well this time for me. I don't have the same resentment of uh, my wife as I did of uh, Mark Marin. <laughs> but sort we did not, we did not um, give up our Blue Apron. And Blue Apron is celebrating its fifth anniversary by bringing back its top 20 recipes from throughout the past five years. That's crazy. That's, I can only imagine how good those are. You can try out Blue Apron's all-time customer faves by going, and I just added that myself. The copy says favorites, and I called it faves. By going to blueapron.com slash majority. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-proportioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. You can customize your recipes each week based upon your preferences. We're almost like 100% seafood now. Seafood or uh, no, no, no meat whatsoever. I guess it's not Pescatarian. 
Yeah, I and guess we're sort of pescatarian thing. as far as Blue Apron's concerned. Um, Blue Apron has several delivery options, so you can choose what fits your needs, and there's no weekly commitment, so you only get the deliveries you want. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card, pre-proportioned ingredients. It can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. Check out this week's menu and get 30 bucks off your first meal with free shipping. That'll feed a family of 3.7 like we have by going to blueapron.com slash majority. You're going to love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. That's blueapron.com slash majority. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. All right, let's play this clip of Steve Bannon because certainly... And I got to be honest with you, there is there seems to be there are multiple things that uh, Trump did over the past week. That are going to. That should. Present uh, the situation where he owns Obamacare. And they're attempting to make it fail. And it's unclear at this point, like what ultimately the strategy is, because I've seen different takes now on what Bannon is going to brag about here as to whether or not it's actually going to create more winners than losers in the system. But it's certainly creating a lot of uncertainty. And there are other things that uh, that Trump uh, signed last week that are going to make the system even more rickety. The best parts of this, of course, were the Medicaid expansion and the patient protections. It's unclear it's unclear, uh, at least where the patient protection stand. They can't touch Medicaid except for, uh, obviously, in those Republican states for the time being, I should say. But here's Steve Bannon bragging to the uh, Values Voter Summit because they vote on values. I don't know what those values are. I think you do. I do know what they are. Yeah, it's, uh, uh Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said it's going to be a middle class tax cut and it's going to have the small business tax cut. This is going to be middle class and for working class people. Pause it for one moment. I just want to remind you that when Mnuchin was asked about this on uh, CNN, I think it was, he said, well, that wasn't a promise. That was actually less of a promise and a pledge and more of like a an idea. I always said, like, I hope you stay at your house, okay? That's right. It's aspirational. Yeah. So just just to correct uh, Bannon, because uh, this was, uh, this. I think this talk did take place after 10 a.m. So, you know, things get a little loose after that time. <laughs> Actually, this is going to be middle class and for working class people, I guarantee you. Then you had Obamacare, not going to make the CSR payments, going to blow that thing up, going to blow those exchanges up, right? Pause it. Um, this is not going to be terribly helpful for uh, Trump when, or the Republicans when they argue that it has collapsed on its own accord when Steve Bannon is bragging that they're doing this to, to blow it up. But I don't think Steve Bannon actually shares that same project as those people. So, And lo and behold, we're going to decertify and get out of the Rand deal. Yeah. That's unclear that they're going to get out of the Iran deal. They've actually kicked the can over to Congress. But I've got to ask uh, about Ben, and we're going to look into this more in the second half. Um, A, where did his southern accent return from? And B, why is he so out of breath in that very slow-paced presentation of what he was talking about? I mean, the guy was completely out of breath, Um Remember you from Sex in the City? <laughs> gonna blow that up. So I tried uh, to get a writing credit on Sex in the City. I didn't get it, and now we're gonna have fascism. There you go. Fuck all of you. There's your Steve Bannon for the day. Hey, folks! Holiday business gifting is fast approaching. Oh wow, that's true. This year, you can choose gifts that are simple to give, uh, joy, and to get. Choose Omaha Steaks. Huge variety. From premium steaks to skillet meals. You can personalize one-on-one service. Easy to order. When we got our gift pack, that was about a year ago now, or maybe six months ago. I can't remember when it was. Wait, it was over the summer. It was like Memorial Day weekend. I have never seen such activity. I've never seen such 
uh, alacrity in this office as I saw going for um, uh, grabbing that stuff. It's amazing how fast Matt can move. When it's he puts very his cool. Exactly. On all, like, doo, doo, doo. So all of a sudden he moves like his books. It's gourmet food. It's a holiday gift. It never disappoints. And you can personalize each gift for a more meaningful experience. Just for my listeners, enjoy special holiday pricing on the perfect business gift. You don't have to give it just for business, too. That's the dirty little secret. They'll never know. It's an ideal holiday gift for your clients, employees, partners. Oh, maybe your boss. Guys? Uh, Maybe not in a certain (laughs) sense. It includes four bacon-wrapped tri-tip steaks, four Omaha steak burgers, four gourmet franks, two boneless pork chops, four kielbasa sausages, four free caramel apple tartlets, plus you get free shipping. The whole exclusive holiday gift package is only $59.99. Go to omahasteaks.com, type report in the search bar, and choose the perfect business gift. you got to type it in the search bar. They're, they're sneaky about this. you got to type report in the search bar because not everybody gets this deal. Again, visit omahasteaks.com, enter code report in the search bar to send or experience this exclusive gift package for only $59.99, and it ships for free. All right, going to take a quick break. When we come back, Wendell Potter founder of tarbell.org. We'll be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program author of Deadly Spin and Nation on the Take. He's a reformed health insurance industry executive and the founder of Tarbell.org, which is, Wendell, is that launching basically this week? We're going to be launching the crowdfunding campaign to get this really up and running. The crowdfunding campaign starts on October the 23rd, which is Monday. Uh, from a week from today, and it's one of the most ambitious crowdfunding for journalism projects ever undertaken in this country. We want to raise quite a bit of money. We've already raised uh, 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 enough to get us to this stage. We've been laying the platform or the groundwork for this for for now more than a year, and we're getting so darn close. We uh, uh, think that we can raise a significant amount of money through our crowdfunding campaign to uh, produce some of the most important journalism this country's ever seen. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it, and we'll put that link on our uh, site at majority.fm. Uh, Wendell, over the years, and I guess we've known each other for quite some time, I, I have learned uh, so yeah. much about um, the health insurance industry from you um, after you sort of crossed over from the dark side into the, uh, the, the, the side of light um, after your time. <laughs> As an insurance, um, you were in the, the, the communications department there, right? Is that right? That's right. I actually worked for two big health insurance companies over 20 years. First, it was Humana and then Cigna. And at uh, once in different times, I ran the 
communication shops for both of those big companies. So I was the guy who was the chief spokesman for, for those companies and uh, I helped craft uh, communications plans, uh, strategies to try to influence public opinion the way that we wanted public opinion to be shaped. Um, all right. So let's, uh, with that said, let's dig into what's taken place over the past week and a half. I mean, I know uh, you and I have, have talked many times in the past about the shortcomings of uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and uh, <clears throat> but um, right now we're looking at at something. I don't know. So the the uh, the Frankenstein version of the Affordable Care Act, I guess, is where yeah. we're headed yeah. uh, under Trump. Give it. Give us a sense of like uh, now this week we saw multiple executive uh, orders that really don't do anything the moment they launch. Right. They basically task. That's right. Different departments to do certain things. Let's talk about those. Like what. Um, uh, tell us about those executive orders and what they mean. Well, some of the most damaging parts of the executive orders would, uh, would take us back to the, the days before the Affordable Care Act was passed in which so many Americans were enrolled in junk insurance plans, plans that uh, uh, had relatively low premiums but didn't cover much of anything. So people were really buying uh, junk insurance, and this would enable that to happen once again. Uh, the executive orders, uh, as you correctly noted, uh, instructs the various departments of government involved in this to uh, come up with new regulations. And there has to be a period of time in which the public can comment on what they come up with. So it's going to take a little little while before this can be implemented and hopefully maybe never implemented at all. As you probably know, some attorneys general in several states have uh, uh, announced uh, they're filing litigation against the government to, to try to block this from happening. But it could go forward. So, all right. So, one of the uh, one one set of the regulations uh, allows for the creating of associations, right? I mean, tell us what what right. what, what is that? And 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 I should say too. I mean, just as uh, I just so that I put a pin in this for folks, that the 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 full name of the Affordable Care Act was actually the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, and it was the patient protection right. stuff that made our insurance be something other than just insurance in name only. Yeah. In fact, uh, it's regrettable that that part of the name just, just kind of disappeared because that was, in my view, the most important part of the legislation. Some of the most important, yeah, bringing people into coverage is very important, but making insurance companies behave better to be more uh, consumer focused and to stop doing things that they should have not done ever anyway, like, uh, uh, selling junk insurance and dropping people from the policies when they got sick, uh, charging women more than men. A lot of these things uh, were changed by the Affordable Care Act. They were true patient protection. What the president wants to do is take us back to the days when uh, insurance companies could get away with that and more. Uh, association health plans. It's not a new concept, but uh, uh, it would really be devastating to so many people. It, it enables small businesses in particular uh, to band together in an association and to circumvent uh, the rules and regulations in the state uh, in which they're based uh, to uh, to put together the health insurance policies that uh, might not even cover hospitalization, uh, that uh, would not cover people with pre-existing conditions, would charge uh, people who are older far more than people who are younger. Uh, it gives them the flexibility to do that. Uh, it essentially gives them uh, the ability to do things that big employers do, but go far off into a bad direction of enabling them to uh, really take advantage of, of, of workers. What this essentially is, is a means for some employers to say to their prospective workers, we've got health insurance. We can give you the, some coverage that you need. And I've seen this happen before. A lot of people sign up for that. They fall for that thinking they're getting real coverage when in fact it's almost worthless. In fact, in, in, it, it's probably worse than worthless because people think they're getting coverage that will protect them, and they often find when it's too late that they just don't have the protection that they thought they had. Trump talked a lot, if you recall, during the campaign about removing the uh, invisible lines, as he said, around the states. Well, uh, that is just uh, it, the exact opposite of what most uh, Republicans talk about, about states' rights. This would strip 
uh, state regulators from having the power to protect their consumers because it would enable these associations to go into the state with the least consumer protection, set up business there, and sell policies from there. And if anyone, uh, say, in New York signed up for a policy that was uh, created and, and based in Mississippi, uh, the New York regulators would have very little ability uh, to uh, protect the consumers of New York. Now, now so, so here's the part that I'm a little bit confused about this. My understanding is, is that for whatever reason, Health and Human Services basically um, changed the rule that said you can buy, you can do that that al- uh, uh, that that aspect of it. If you are a, an, a, a if you are an employer providing insurance, you can actually buy um, uh, sign up for a plan in a different state that may have right. different regulations because they they changed that regulation because uh, the Affordable Care Act created a floor. So they were feeling like, well, okay, we have. We have now basically created a, 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 a bottom line for what constitutes health insurance. So if there's slight differences from state to state, that's fine. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, they reverse that. And so how does so it may be the case now that if I'm in New York and I'm an employer and I want to go to, let's say, Alabama and buy my health insurance there because they don't care about the people who live in that state and right. their government. Right. Um, how is it that Alabama would be allowed to um, to skirt the initial restrictions that the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act imposed upon insurance in that state? Well, for one thing, uh, it uh, it uh, uh, makes small employers eligible for uh, a federal law that's been around for a long time that that gives big employers some uh, uh, exemption from, if you will, from from state laws and uh, uh, and even some federal laws, or it's a federal law, uh, so there it supersedes a lot of the state laws, uh, which is uh, something that big employers would take advantage of because they have employers all across the country, and that that makes sense for them. And most of them are are uh, they do it in good faith. They offer uh, policies with good benefits or pretty good benefits uh, for all their workers. This would not. This would give them the same protection, the same ability to be exempt from state laws, but the employers, these associations, would would be able to sell uh, and, and provide really skimpy coverage. Uh, so uh, the 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 thing is, the Affordable Care Act. Or even, here's here's what is disingenuous, uh, partly about this. Insurance companies can sell coverage across state lines already. Right. In fact, Georgia and Rhode Island and a number of states threw out the welcome mat, and they didn't get any takers because it takes a lot of money for an insurance company to set up business in a new state, to learn the regulations of that state, but more importantly, uh, to have uh, enough size to be able to cut good deals with uh, providers, with hospitals and doctors. And uh, and if you don't have good size, a big size of Going into it, you're not going to get those um, uh, those good deals. If you don't get those good deals, you're not going to be able to sell policies at a, at a competitive price. So it's kind of a chicken on the egg kind of thing. The bar uh, to entry would, in these again, states, the bar to entry into new states is, is yeah. extremely high. Extraordinarily high. Any state, doesn't matter. Uh, it's extraordinarily high because you have a situation in which there are, over time, a few insurers have gotten to be very dominant. Uh, they've got the good deals. And if you're coming into a market fresh, you don't have anybody signed up. Uh, and so you're not going to get the same kind of treatment, the same kind of deals that a big Blue Cross plan that's been there for 50 years is going right. to get. So, okay. So um, what of the the short-term plans? Um, tell us what those are and what the implications are. I guess uh, uh, Trump has um, signed an EO... Uh, promoting the extension of these things from three months to a year. Is that right? That's right. It is possible to buy some short-term coverage, and some people are in situations in which that makes sense. Um, but um, uh, these can, uh, again, circumvent the, uh, the letter and the intention of the Affordable Care Act by uh, letting insurers sell policies that don't comply with what most people, most insurance plans uh, comply have to, have to comply with the Affordable Care Act in terms of uh, benefits and uh, uh, and uh, pre-existing conditions and things like that. 
So that's a problem. A lot of people will uh, be in these plans longer than they otherwise would have been. What this does and what our market does in this country, it forces people to gamble on on their lives, on whether or not they're going to be healthy uh, a week from today or a month from today and not get hit by a car. Most people who buy these policies and who will unfortunately buy, I think, these association health plan policies, uh, maybe young people who think that I've been healthy, I'm going to stay healthy, uh, but people can get sick at any time and injured uh, uh, and rack up uh, huge medical bills. Uh, it's something we can't pr- anticipate uh, or control. Uh, but we in this country, because of the market that's set up and, and will be made even worse if, these, if this executive order actually goes forward, um, uh, we already, even with the Affordable Care Act, we're the only country in the developed world where people, even with insurance, have to file often for bankruptcy because of high medical bills. A lot of people are in high deductible plans, which were not, unfortunately, outlawed by the Affordable Care Act. And some of those deductibles are so high that people just can't pay out of pocket what they're, they're obligated to pay. And it's why so many people go to these uh, outdoor clinics, like the remote area medical clinics around the country. Uh, they have insurance but they're in high deductible plans. They just don't have enough money to see a doctor, or go, certainly to go to the hospital. Okay, so, um, and, and is there, uh, are there any other things that come out of that executive order other than uh, the, the, the cost um, subsidy uh, payments? Because um, uh, I... Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good point, because that was a separate thing. One of the other actions that... Uh, uh, that the administration is doing is cutting off the subsidies uh, that uh, uh, make it possible for people to, to buy coverage that's more affordable uh, and to help them cover the, their out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, with that money go, going away, uh, a lot of people will just not sign up for uh, insurance because they won't be able to afford it. Uh, Trump talks about uh, bailing, this being a bailout for the insurance industry. It's true that the money goes through the insurance companies, but it is for the benefit of people who are low and middle income Americans so that they can pay the premiums and cover their out of pocket expenses. You know, Sam, you know, as well as I do, I, I hate our, our system because it has failed and the Affordable Care Act doesn't, doesn't really fix it. It just puts a band aid on a an ugly system, as Uwe Reinhardt, the Princeton economist, has said. But it's where we are, and there were some important protections. Now we're stripping away some of the important protections and taking away money from low and, inc- low and middle income people so that they can buy coverage. It's, it's just a, a tragedy. All right. So, all right. So now, now, maybe you can help me with this because I've seen some stuff that has been written that suggests these cost sharing uh, reduction subsidies that. They the way that they're going about this may actually make it the insurance cheaper for some people. So this is and and and, and I don't know. I, I honestly, I, this stuff is too. Um, uh, this is too difficult for me to work through on some level. But my understanding is this: there's we have the 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 premium tax credits are a subsidy. For people making between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty line, let's just assume this is a state that is not uh, where Medicaid has not been expanded to 133 percent of of poverty. So they you get tax credits um, that will fill the gap between um, the 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 amount of money that you pay and the premium that comes with the second least expensive silver plan. I can't believe like we're even like how like kludgy this is, <laughs> but that oh, the, God. The, yeah. the, 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 the cost uh, sharing reduction subsidies deal with uh, people who are getting, who are between one a hundred percent or excuse me, between 200% and 400% of the, right. uh, the federal poverty line. And right. That that for some people, the cost of insurance for like gold plans will go down because of how just sort of intricate this formula is. And for the life of me, I mean, two things arise. One, I can you explain this? And two, like, why do we have to have a system that is so ridiculous? Yeah. 
Well, I'm going to answer that second one first because we have the system that is so ridiculous because uh, we are leaving the healthcare uh, industry in the hands of uh, companies that are uh, beholden to Wall Street. Uh, that's why. Uh, and there is, and, and they are able to write huge campaign checks to Democrats as well as Republicans. Uh, their lobbying is extraordinarily effective. Uh, so they have the ability uh, and the power to make sure that whatever uh, is passed, uh, or even regulations that are written as best as they possibly can do, protects their interests. So that's one reason. We, it's because of money and politics when you get right down to it. Uh, and it's just... Uh, something that we cannot, as a country, continue to tolerate. It gives these big corporations the power uh, that, they, that they've actually stolen from us. Uh, it's a, the main reason I'm, I'm starting Tarbell is to shine a light on just exactly that, to help people understand how our power has been stolen and to pull no punches. Um, to your, your first question, it is so incredibly complicated. I don't know that we've got time to, to really explain how that would work. You've got these these levels of, of coverage, the, you know, the, the gold, the silver, the, uh, the bronze, uh, and people uh, are just often baffled about uh, what, what's covered under each plan, how much does these cost, what's my uh, out-of-pocket expenses going to be, uh, if my income, if I make a dollar more than uh, a certain amount, uh, then I won't get any subsidies at all. At all. Sam, it's just absolutely preposterous and ludicrous if something like that is set up, something that complex. But it's what we got. Um, all right. Well, so, I mean, I guess it remains to be seen. The, the, the key, I guess, is, takeaway from this is that the, the level of uncertainty is going to make it mm, le- continually, yeah. continually less attractive to insurance companies to even be in the individual market, for which for a lot of them it's not profitable at all anyways, right? And so... Right. Um, yeah. And so... so how shaky does it make this already shaky part of the entire um, Obamacare, if you will? It makes it much more, uh, much shakier. Uh, there are a, a, a number of insurance companies that really want to serve this market, and most of them, quite frankly, are the nonprofit health insurance plans. Most of the big for profits, like the ones I used to work for, have already bailed out because their shareholders want to have a certain profit margin. If that's not being met on every book of business within their portfolio, uh, they, they pressure the companies to, to change. And that's why you've seen such an exodus from the markets of these big insurance companies. Uh, a lot of those that remain are nonprofit Blue Cross plans, Kaiser Permanente, and, and, and others in, in New England uh, and around the country that uh, are not as driven by the demands of, of investors. Uh, so they want to stay in and do this uh, to, to cover this population. And keep in mind, we're talking about a, a relatively small percentage of the population here, right. uh, people who have to buy coverage through the individual market. We're not talking about the vast majority of people. Um, so there are a lot of insurance companies that remain want to stay in there and, they, and make a good faith effort to provide the coverage that's valuable to the, the people that uh, depend on them. Uh, this can make it more difficult for them because uh, they – they will, there's no doubt, have to raise premiums and shift more of the cost to people if this goes forward. Now, some people, yeah, some people uh, may benefit. People who are younger and healthier uh, and in certain income levels uh, can claim that they probably are benefited, benefiting if this goes through. But the vast majority of people, people who uh, uh, don't make a lot of money, people who've had some illness in the past, uh, uh, people who are uh, just you know, getting older, they're not going to benefit from this in any meaningful way and probably will be significantly hurt. Now, insurance companies for 2018, a lot of them just anticipated this craziness and anticipated that uh, the, well, they knew the market was uncertain. And so they, they, they jacked up their premiums. Uh, premiums are actually higher for 2018 because of the uncertainty of what the administration and Congress might do. So they already baked in, if you will. Uh, they're literally uh, insuring that themselves. That are higher. Uh, they're, they're, they're literally exactly. insuring them, exactly. the, themselves from the, the chance that there's going to be less, um, uh, I guess, less, uh, either less clients, less customers, and yeah. less um, yeah. subsidies for those customers. And I imagine, too, right. they're yeah. also looking at the huge cuts in the navigators who are the people who are supposed to help people get into the program 
and oh, yeah. and they're realizing yep. like we're going to have a huge uh, loss in in signups. Well, it's absolutely the case. They've cut funding for the navigators. Uh, they, they've cut funding from advertising to have people be more aware of of, uh, of the marketplace and when to sign up. And uh, so all of that's being eliminated. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's long past due for people to start referring to this as Trump care because it is that with these changes and this uncertainty, the actions they're taking, the, the money they're stripping out, uh, it is, it's changed it so significantly that it, it doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to what we have always called Obamacare. All right. Well, um, anything else that you think we should know at this point, uh, Wendell, aside from the fact that a single payer system would be much better? Well, I think uh, I think it's going to be incumbent on the media, and I know you do an excellent job, Sam. But I, I hope that that others in the media will follow this and report on how this affects real people. Uh, I have talked to so many people over the years who've benefited from being able at long last to buy coverage, and a lot of those folks are just not going to be able to do it anymore. People are going to die because they uh, uh, they just don't have the money to enroll in in healthcare a healthcare plan. And we're going to see health care providers being hurt because we'll once again see uh, high levels of uncompensated care in hospitals. It's just, it has ripple effects. And I think it's going to be very important for all of us to keep a close watch on uh, how those ripples uh, uh, affect uh, our health care system, uh, our health care providers, and individuals and families. Not to mention, we're going to see that rate of uh, bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy, uh, shoot back up. I mean, I think half of yep. half of all bankruptcies used to be from uh, medical costs, and I think half of those yeah. uh, were cut. Essentially, uh, the rate of uh, bankruptcy yep. was cut. Personal bankruptcy under uh, yeah. this system, as flawed as it is. Uh, Wendell, yeah. thanks so much. Good luck with Tarbell.org. I'm very excited to um, uh, Thank you, see Sam. what you guys are going to produce. Uh, I'm, I'm appreciate it very much. All right. Uh, I appreciate the Sam and yours. Thank you. Wendell Potter, thanks again. All right, folks. Happy Monday. At least there's no nuclear war yet. Still got time. Still time. So much time. So much time for uh, that'll probably that probably won't kick in till Wednesday. But at that point, I will be in Las Vegas. And speaking of which, here's what the uh, weekly schedule will be this week. Oh. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have an interview with Corey Robin. Uh, Michael will do the fun half. Corey Robin. And right then here. on Wednesday... Members only day. We're bringing that back, just like Prince Spaghetti. People remember that? No. Just blank faces. What is that? Wednesday's Prince Spaghetti Day, and um, in what, what part of Boston? Boston's Boston's North End. You don't okay. remember those commercials? No, dude. All right. And uh, Thursday and Friday, I will be in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, interviewing. Attorneys, we're going to be doing, um, there's a huge blockbuster story about uh, opioids in um, 60 Minutes in Washington Post. And um, if you've been a regular listener to this program, you have heard about what the pharmaceutical companies have done and their culpability in this um, accord for at least a couple of years. Because there's always attorneys down there who are going to, who are, Pursuing cases about opioids. I'm going to be talking to some a uh, couple attorneys about that, um, and then who knows what other cases we're going to find when we're down there. I'm trying to uh, secure the attorneys who are suing the um, the bump butt makers uh, mm -hmm. from the shooting that took place in Vegas, um, and um, well, we'll be talking to other attorneys. I think um, who knows who else will be It'll there. Be so Sam and. Attorney mode. Got all excited there. Yes. No, I'm You're very like, excited. Hung over. I'm gambling and there's lawyers. That's basically so exciting. That's basically it. It gets a little bit weird. Hello. I've run into some very strange people there. We've In heard some very Vegas. strange people from there. Some yeah. I don't even talk about. It gets stranger, <laughs> believe me. You've you've said some things off air. Um 
Folks, just a reminder, it is your membership that makes this show possible. You can become a member today by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. And we say thank you by giving you sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours worth of extra content every day. Uh, also, it's commercial free. So there's no commercials, in other words, uh, when you get the member show feed. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And if you buy your crap from Amazon or you buy your crap from Jet, do so through our link at majorityreportkickback.com. Click on that link, buy your stuff through there, figure out some system so that you always go through that link. I don't know how sophisticated you are with the web, but apparently these browsers have all new fangled things where you can actually just sort of leave it. Leave it sort of make a replica of that link that would live in your browser. Be easy to access it. Yes, exactly. And uh, we get a kickback, thus majorityreportkickback.com. Also, uh, don't forget, tomorrow night is um, this week's Too Much Brooks show. Is that what it is? TMBS? No. The Michael Brooks show. Mm, oh. There you go. Ha, 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 ha. Are you doing um, that for yourself? <laughs> Who's going to be the guest? Do you know yet? Uh, I am going to have on Mike Hanna from Al Jazeera and former uh, CNN Jerusalem bureau chief to talk about Iran deal and the fallout. And then um, another guest on Catalonia. Uh, so uh, Michael's having on someone from apparently a uh, ISIS-controlled network. Is that right? Yes. I wanted the <laughs> ISIS perspective on the Iran deal. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. And then uh, Nando Vila, who's a producer <laughs> at Fusion on Catalonia. Fusion. Oh, I understand. Yeah. That is yeah, a... It's drawn um, by cu uh, Cuban the, drug traffickers. Uh, so I yes. want a trafficking and terrorist perspective. Lat Latinx. Um, uh, the Zetas. All right. Well... All right. Very, and, very uh, broad mind. You can also can just uh, sign up for that on iTunes as well. You can either watch it live tomorrow night or uh, sign up for iTunes to get all your uh, uh, all the past shows. All right, quick break. 646-257-3920 is the number. We will take your phone calls and your IMs in just a moment.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fun half of the program, wherein we have fun on this half of the program. Let's uh, kick it all off. From the Values Voter Summit, which took place this weekend, ladies and gentlemen, in Values Voter Summit land, America, where would this be? In Washington, D.C. would be my, imag my where I would imagine it. Look at that backdrop. So magnificent. Um, here is Dr. Sebastian Gorka on the stage of the Values Voters Summit, making it clear that sometimes you can do more on the outside than on the in. Wait, which one are we doing? Which one? I only have one on my list. Oh, which one do you which one do you have? Oh, okay. And then what's the other one about the, the GOP establishment? Yeah, the rhinos. Why would we not have both those on the list? Cuz looks better. Okay. So we'll do we'll do both, but let's do this one first. A breakdown in the Jew Express, I see. Mm. <laughs> you run the media, but just not well. Here we go. The left has no idea mm. how much more damage we can do to them as private citizens, <laughs> as people unfettered by being part of the U.S. government. And as you can see, I right, pause it for just a, like a weird reaction from the crowd. <laughs> like, wait, is he really saying this? And then there's like three people are like, yay. Uh, so here, let me just uh, uh, make it clear. Uh, apparently, Seb Gorka was forced to serve in the administration. I he served in the administration so that I could have immunity for life, which is something you think <laughs> is usually restricted to Jews and your money lending schemes. Well, how does that get immunity for life? Because of time served in the White House. I mean, is your understanding really so facile? <laughs> <laughs> so he was, uh, he's been unshackled, ladies and gentlemen, from his self shackulation that he uh, suffered uh, in the White House when he took that job. Now I can rev my car and switch from neutral right into drive. Vroom, 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 Skid out. Vroom, vroom. No one can tell me not to do that anymore. In the White House, you can only spy on Muslims legally. Outside, you can spy on everyone. Mm. The whole world is your ex-girlfriend and you can stalk her. 24 marathon can do now. <laughs> All right, let's continue. This. As people unfettered... <sighs> That's by being it. part of the U.S. government. Mm. And as you can see from the campaigning I did for Judge Moore and Steve as well, <laughs> we have begun. <laughs> wow. First of all, this guy cannot deliver a speech. Uh, he's like his rhythm so off that nobody knows when to fake applaud. And he seems to be very skittish about leaving Steve out of a speech. Don't forget to mention my name up there, you fucking, uh, fucking James Bond terrorist guy. I I'll fucking made, take you off the master. Uh, the campaigning I did for Judge Moore. Oh, and Steve, too. Steve did. Yes. I yeah. don't want to take all of the credit It'd for be Judge Luther Moore Strange. winning. He's a tall mm. freak, and you don't know shit. If you don't take me credit, I'm going to take off the poster you blame terrorism on true lies. Put it in drive. <laughs> <laughs> so, Seb Gorka, after uh, first talking about how he's been unshackled from his self shackulation in the White House, and now mm. he can do much more damage to the left by screwing up the voting for the People's Choice Awards for the com best comedy. We're going to slam that. And we're also going to mm, make a run on Chardonnay, and they won't be able to buy any during the holidays. I don't know what he's going to do to the left. I'm going to go down to Radio Shack. Oh, it's out of business. 
Well, whatever. Get a whole bunch of home spy equipment to use <laughs> on the left. <laughs> My friend Steve has already evaded five restraining orders on several X's, and I'm going to learn from him about how to terrorize He's the a master left. of the arcane and dark arts. <laughs> no one, no one is going to tell me not to drag race the left at stoplights anymore. Pretty soon, the whole liberal left is going to be like, Gorka, stop calling us, please. <laughs> and I'm going to say, no, I know how to disguise my number. I'm about to turn on my Twitter foo. <laughs> Destroy. Can't me. block me if I'm browsing in an incognito <laughs> browser. The left is so <laughs> foolish. Foolish. Mm. You have no idea how many fake Twitter accounts I have. They're all coming at you. So after he does that. And Steve also knows how to dispose of bodies and acid. So <laughs> just putting that out there as well. So after uh, his turn at the, the Values Voter Summit, telling the left, watch out. He's got another message, too, for a certain class of people. 2018. 2018 will be the crucial year. Mm. This is the year. Steve has declared war on the rhino class, as have I. <laughs> and we must tell them we have had enough. We really? must. The rep what, so wait, the war is just going to be tell them that we've had enough? Is that the war? <laughs> we have, we have, we've surrounded them on two sides. Steve has declared war on them. So have I. I dealt with so, rhinos in Hungary. They were the ones that wanted to denounce the Nazi party. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck <Father>. that. <laughs> so now we just need two more people to declare war on the rhino class and we will have them surrounded. <laughs> don't, you don't want to be surrounded by Steve, Steve believe has. me. Ask some strippers in Florida how that turned out. Isn't Steve the coolest? Steve's He's the, the coolest, coolest guy. And so am I. I also hang out with Steve. So he's cool, and I'm cool because I'm with him. I hang out with I him. I have two of Steve's mobile numbers, including one of his burner phones that he uses after he disposes of bodies and acid. That's the kind of guy I am. I know the first two numerals of Steve's pin, of his pin that he uses at the ATM. That's how good of friends I am with Steve. My wife, he you can loves guess what the second two are. Teen, yeah. <laughs> extrapolate from their pajama boy Jews. Sometimes Steve calls me Borka. He just like combines the B on Seb and drops the G because that's his nickname for me. That's the kind of guy he is. we're good friends. My wife told me I don't get an allowance anymore if I stop blocking for Steve. So can S I mention Steve's name again? This pin, Steve bought one just like this flag lapel pin. We have the same flag lapel pins. Both are cool. I tell him he's like Johnny Cash, and then I give him a back rub, and I'm proud to play my role in the war on terrorism. <laughs> Understanding really so facile that two heterosexual men can't give a man that he worships and admire a full body rub while he talks about <laughs> bad Guatemalans from Starbucks. Is your understanding really so puerile? Speaking of Steve, he really likes Steve. Steve's the best. He's a cool guy. Honestly, <laughs> Seb Gorka talks about Steve Bannon like the way that my four and a half year old son talks about like the kid with cool sneakers. Did you see how Steve did that hit and run and he didn't even stop to see if that homeless guy was dead or not? He just kept going. So Steve cool. Steve is so cool. <laughs> so cool. I just heard a thud and I was like, what's that? And Steve just didn't even blink an eye. Steve was like, I don't know, maybe an unlucky day for him. And then he crunched an entire Budweiser with one hand. The best thing I like about Steve, he's not afraid to go on Hannity's show, wasted. <laughs> Here he is on Hannity's show. Steve Bannon, on um, Sean Hannity's show, um, after this, reportedly, and I, I have no confirmation on this, but my understanding is that after this segment, Hannity and Bannon went 
to an all-you-can-eat buffet and never left. <laughs> um, here is uh, Bannon talking about how every, every single GOP incumbent, except for his buddy, is going to be challenged. And the information to come, to be T TBK or whatever they, we're going to give you that information just in a bit. Here we go. They have to understand. There's a basic agenda that President Trump ran on and won. He carried states that Republicans haven't, haven't carried in living memory. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. This agenda works. The American people voted for it. It's their responsibility. By the way, McConnell would not be majority leader unless Trump in North Carolina, in Missouri, in Wisconsin, was able to carry those senators across the finish line. It is incumbent upon them to back President Trump's plan, but you don't see it. What you saw what Corker said today is what they talk about on Capitol Hill. That's when I left the White House. Remember, I said, I'm going after the Republican establishment, and we're going to go after them. We're going to challenge as a coalition. Give me the coming states. Together. There's a coalition coming together that's going to challenge every Republican incumbent except for Ted Cruz, whether it's Utah, Wyoming, uh, whether it's uh, in, in Orrin Nevada, Hatch in Utah. Orrin Hatch in Utah. Today, Boyd Matheson, who is the chief of staff Pause it for, for one uh, second. I just want you to be clear. That is three states. They're going to go after every state, but the only ones he could actually mention are three states. So my, my suspicion is not so many states. Every state is going to be all Every of, state. Like every Missouri. single one of the check three. Out, check out my thought process. <laughs> I can see. Today, Boyd Matheson, who is the chief of staff for, uh, for Mike Lee, came out and said that he's going to set up an exploratory committee. North is Dakota. That, in North Dakota, we don't have it. That's, uh, that's, oh, that's a hot right. scam. Uh, but we're going, by the way, oh, going pardon, to pardon, pardon me. Could you, could, I'm sorry, Who, who's that? Hoskam? Hoskam? Hodge Cam. He said that he's going to set up an exploratory committee. North Is Dakota. That, in, no, in North Dakota, we don't have it. That's, uh, that's, oh, that's a hot right. scam. Uh, okay. Going, okay. That's Hodge Cam. Hodge Cam. All right. So what's interesting here is that, A, uh, Sean Hannity, North Dakota. I want to know what Republican incumbent you're going after without realizing that there's no Republican incumbent up for for election there. So now we've managed to name four states out of the uh, 50 some odd states that we have in this country. And um, and of course, Hodgkin is not a person. Well, Hodgkin might be a person, but that person is not the senator Heitkamp. Now hey, hey Camp is a Democrat from North Dakota. Hey, Hodgkin. Hodgkin. Hey, 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 Sean, will you vaping again? <laughs> Fuck you, bitch. <laughs> Smoke a real cigarette. Fuck. Let's go to the la uh, the phones. You call from a 210 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam. How you doing? This is John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. Uh, How are you, sir? Uh, I'm good. Great interview with uh, Wendell Potter. Also, a good interview with uh, Robert Borsage on uh, Ring of Fire. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, we've been talking about Trump's sabotage of the ACA since last November, and it's so disgusting that Trump is actually dropping the cost-sharing reductions. Now, there are two different methods that low- and, and medium-income uh, people can save money uh, on their ACA plans. Uh, the first is the, the premium tax cuts, uh, which a single person who has a salary of $12,060 is eligible for, which is right at the poverty level, all the way up to 400%, uh, which is, covers somebody uh, making uh, less than $48,240. Uh, and that, that basically lowers premiums. Now, the, the actual cost-sharing reductions are something that are completely separate, which I right. didn't really understand right. until recently. Uh, so, so you're eligible that also if you're at 100% of poverty, but it only goes up to 250% of poverty. And unlike the, the tax credits, uh, which basically just covers the premiums, this covers copays deductibles, coinsurance, and prescription drugs. Now, uh, there are 6 million people are in the individual market, and only about a million don't get a tax credit. So that's about 83% actually get a subsidy. Uh, so, you know, I just think that the the CBO is – they're saying that this one uh, thing that they're going to do, the cost-sharing reductions – 
uh, being dropped is going to cause a million people to lose their insurance. I think it's going to be a lot higher than that because they're basically saying only 20% of the people who get a subsidy are going to drop out of this. Now, if you have if the rates are raised by 30% and they're cutting out all of these different things, it just seems like it's inevitable that people just won't have the money to pay for this. I mean, Apparently, how do you feel about that? There, well, I'll tell you something. I've read, and I, I mentioned this to, to, to Wendell Potter, and, and honestly, I'm still trying to work through it. There's a guy who writes um, at Balloon Juice, of all, of all places, a um, guy named David Anderson. And he has he's he's apparently like a, a research associate at, at Duke, uh, and he used to be a bureaucrat at the um, uh, I think it's the, the the Duke Health Plan, and he's worked out some I I don't know what I would call it a theory or he's just worked it out that some people are actually going to save money because the way that these costs. Um, sharing reductions are are pegged to a specific silver plans and that right. uh, and, and I for the life of me honestly like I've got to read it over like four or five more times before I understand it the bottom line is though is that there's going to be such there's going to be these insurance companies are going to end up leaving <laughs> because there's just too many there's just too many variables that are going around that are too hard to figure out. I mean, that's the problem. Um, and so the, the it's unclear what's going to happen. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things, like we won't have a sense until 2019. But I'll tell you this, on election day 2018, by then, okay, you're going to see double digit multiple double digit increases in um in the cost of insurance and at that point it's you know we've already saw it baked into 2018 because it was an awareness like he's been threatening to do this for some time i think it's going to get even worse uh by the summer of 2018 people won't be losing their health insurance until you get to the end of that fiscal year but i i think it's going to be a mess for them um and it's really just a question of like I don't know. It seems like Trump is just kicking everything to Congress because he feels like he's got his people and he can blame it on them. And maybe he will be able to. I don't know. I don't know. It's I I think we need more time to figure out exactly what's going to happen. Okay, uh, there's an article uh, that came out last Friday uh, saying Ted Cruz is the headline warns GOP could face Watergate level blowout in midterms if it fails on taxes uh, health care. Now, my theory is is just the opposite. I mean, I, I feel that they they can't they don't have a winning strategy because I mean, if if they actually continue to fail on on taxes and on health care, their base is base is probably going to be have a diminished uh, turnout. Now, if they do uh, push uh, and actually are able, I don't think they're going to be able to do health care. But if they are able to to push all these you know, uh, tax cuts for the rich. You know, let's do not kid ourselves. This isn't tax reform. This right. is tax cuts for the rich. It's, it's going to uh, exacerbate income inequality. Uh, I mean, is that really something that's a winning hand in the mind of independents? We already know that, that uh, half of Republicans don't agree with their health care plans, and that's one of the reasons why it wasn't able to pass. I, I think... So it just seems... I think... I think there's a lot of people who, who vote out there based upon they are or are not doing something and don't have really, frankly, the uh, I mean, I don't know if it'll make a big difference or not. But I think like the 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 sense in Washington is that all we got to do, we got to do something. It can't be the do nothing Congress, because then we're you know, it's got to be we did. We passed tax reform. We got to be able to say we did something. And so I think like, you know, then at the very least, um, the the different networks in which they disseminate information can can work on whether it's good or bad. Right. I mean, but them not passing anything is like an irrefutable fact. Everything else, you know, these days. Like we had that conversation with McKay Coppins is just that's just an opinion. 
And so I don't know. That's their theory anyways. But appreciate the call, John. All right. Thank you. Thanks, bud. We still need to set that debate up. I know. I mean, when we get back, I mean, it's all. It's going to be a whole new world when I get back from Vegas. Believe me, because I'm going to come back with. Oh, wow, you're going. Oh, big winnings. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's going to be sick. It's going to be sick. I'm going to need. I'm going to probably. I'm going to be able to go back on a plane. Excuse probably me, Mister take... Yasamura. Will you hold my drink? It's just going to be more like, um, <laughs> hey guys, can I hitch a ride in the Brinks truck that you're bringing back my uh, winnings from? <laughs> That would be exactly what you would do. You'd probably still you want a plane skip, ride. You would skip the jet and ask to be dressed up in a guard's uniform and ride the Brinks truck. I would for like 3,000 exactly miles. Do that. Do. Definitely do that. Yes. And then you would harass the guy and be like, you know about Medicare spending? And yeah, by around Ohio. Yeah, around, maybe around <laughs> Ohio. He he'd be like, right. oh, I think I'll get on the but jet. Why would we be going to Ohio from Vegas? Driving back to New York? You, you go through Ohio? From Vegas? Probably. No. You wouldn't. Do you this know anything most, about the geography of dude, this country? You, you, why do you want to risk dude, getting put a Rain map Man up there right, right now. now? Wait a second. This is not Rain Man. Vegas is in <laughs> this Nevada. This is not Rain Man. This is put a map up so I could interrupt the show to talk about geography. Well, wait a second. It's not Rain Man at all. Listen. It's the opposite. I mean, this, this is what's happening with the kids these days. They, uh-oh, is he going to put it? Oh, shit. Oh shit! I guess you would. You that. saw that's the, that's the northern route. Oh, but world star! No, no, I'm gonna go. No, first of all, I'm gonna go the Green Mountain Parkway, and I can't do that if I go to Ohio. I gotta go through Tennessee. <laughs> yes, the slow route. Is that the fast route goes through Ohio? Oh my god! Sad, <laughs> sad. I would go through West Virginia. That's a weird way to go. Everyone makes go mistakes. That's. It's crazy. I don't know why you would Build do an alliance with Jimmy Dore. Calling from a 651 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, hi, my name is Chris Lepaco. Yes, the Chris Lepaco. The Chris um, Lepaco. I, I Back me up on this whole uh, uh, Ohio thing. Would you drive through Ohio if you're going to Vegas from uh, New York? No, right? Why would you? I, w- I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't drive through Ohio, period. Right. For any reason at all. Bingo. Yeah. Ohio's. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Forget it. Anyway, um, I heard you while I was on hold. Like, I won't, I won't say what I actually heard, but like, people waiting on hold for a long time kind of grind your gears a little bit. Is that right? Well, yeah, I'm going to come up with a. Uh, I've got a. I've got a solution for that. But yes. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. I'm glad to hear about that. This is going to play well into that. Okay. And also speaking about Jimmy Dore, I responded to the Rational Nationals' response to his own call to your show. Where uh, he you did were a response to his, his own response. call. Yeah, but let's just be clear. I think he that there's did, yeah, something. He posted a... I just 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 Go something ahead. that needs to be noted before we have any further discussion. This Rational Nationals Patreon Patreon of the Michael Brooks show. Therefore, he's a good guy, and that's it. That's all it takes. Yep. Done. Okay. All right. He he also said he likes me on Twitter. So uh, yes, whatever. He's really anyway, taking a Canadian responded... track to things. He's <laughs> killing you with I, kindness. I. Uh, Can't anyway, so I, I responded to Rational National's response to his own call to your show where you were responding to his response to your response to callers who criticized your response to Jimmy Dore refusing to respond to you. What? Got it? <laughs> Got it. Yeah? How did that go? Okay. It was, it was, it was deep, really deep. Um, <laughs> when people call in and mention Jimmy Dore in the future, wait till I'm done, I suggest that you just hang up. If they don't like the way that you're talking about him, Maybe they shouldn't wait on hold and then bring him up. You know what I'm saying? So I know up. they you know that's a People funny, that's the amazing come. thing is that I don't think I'd mentioned Jimmy Dore, you know, I- I- except for in passing, you know, just like a, like, Oh, there's a Supreme court. That's important. Uh, despite what some people say or something like that. That's probably the most I've talked about, uh, Jimmy Dore. Um, Sam, Sam, but, but you then and Jimmy are on the, right the guy calls side. in and gets me all riled about it. And, and that's going to, it's going to take uh, like another week for me to calm down from that. I was and laughing the, the so hard is, over the weekend watching that man. It was amazing. Like you all in Bob the face. Uker, you look, you look like Arthur. <laughs> like it's bullshit. Well, and then, I've never seen that cartoon. So I just, don't know. you gotta look the other, The other, the other parts of this is they, they say that they like Jimmy Dore because, you know, he speaks to the emotion and the, the, he gets angry and blah, 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 blah. But then they're mad because 
you get emotional and angry, whatever word you want to use, you get animated over this type of stuff, and you have facts on your side. So you walk them down the logical trail, they get cornered, and then they just don't want to acknowledge that they're wrong, and so that's how that goes down. So anyway, was it, wait, Michael, you were all. telling yeah, all right, well, Chris, the Chris Lopaco, I well, here, appreciate here, it. Look, here's the, the, here's the thing. The Michael Brooks Jimmy. told me these Mike uh, the Michael Brooks told me that uh, somebody put in the comments that I don't get this emotional about bankers. I don't have anybody calling up defending bankers, but if they did, it wouldn't take me very long <laughs> to get emotional about it. Well, no, and I, 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 about I it. think more to the point is you I never just got to say, as you seem very very mad at for Jamie Dimon. I mean, he seems like a nice fellow. He tipped me very well at uh, the 21 Club back when I was working as a waiter there. To be, f- I think what the more appropriate analogy would be that you don't get as pissed off at libertarians, and that's because you hold them to a lower standard because they're libertarians. Well, libertarians at least have the, um, uh, you know, will actually hang in there and debate. Mm. No, that's true. I don't need. Listen, if Jimmy would actually come on and I had the ability, I'll, I will, I'll, I'll go on Twitter in a, in, in a moment. Well, maybe I'll wait till after the show and invite Jimmy back on the show. Even. Wow. And and you go back to that original debate. I was not getting um, I, I don't think I was the one who was getting all uh, pissy. But here's the until thing, here's I mean, the thing, I specifically Sam. remember you saying, like, don't do it. And he was getting and he was the one who was that getting was an all, I am. Uh, he was the one who was getting all all emotional about it. Uh, but. Yeah, I'm, I'd welcome him back on, and I will be a very genteel. But you guys agree on policy, and that's the fundamental point. Right. So what I don't understand Except is you got Joy Reid running around talking about how my wife should get a Nobel Peace Prize, even though she's the worst feminist in global history and a known murderer. And you get angry at Jimmy Dore, even though you're on the same side. Now, I know that you resent his YouTube numbers, and I know that you badly or desperately want your own show on MSNBC, but the left <laughs> needs to unite. The best is like Jimmy Dore supports labor, except for uh, that uh, that one vote. Hi, this is uh, Bill. I'm calling from uh, Chappaqua. <laughs> I think you and Jimmy Dore agree on a lot more than you disagree on. So I'm just wondering if the war could stop because I think progressive voices on YouTube need to work together to undercover why exactly my wife murdered Seth Rich. <laughs> Uchi Wally. Uh, last, uh, the, for the aim, last day for the aim is December 15th. I don't use your app. I know, I know, but check with Kyle to make sure the app doesn't use aim for IMs. It does not. Um, we will, I think we're going to create a device on the, uh, new site so you can go and you can actually, I am us from the site. Um, but get the app. Why wouldn't you use the app? Most of the people are on the app. I can tell who's not. Uchi Wally is not. Uh, Roy Moore's Steve's on the app. Ro- Steve, Steve was Steve, on the app. Steve's, Steve was the first one that down. <laughs> he's so cool. Steve's, Steve, Steve got it. Steve Allo. sometimes uses the app, and he just does it behind his head. He just does it like this. He doesn't even look at People it. are like, so what's cool. Tinder? Where did you get that sex slave from Vietnam <laughs> from, Steve? He was like, oh, Tinder. It's and then so everyone downloaded cool. it. Cool. Steve is the coolest. Steve kidnapped girls from Latvia before people even knew about it. Everybody else was getting sex slaves from Ukraine. Steve's so cool. <laughs> Roy Morris, boy whore. Sam, I think it's important that we lefties stay morally consistent and call out the folks harassing Dana Loesch. This is the kind of thing that's below us. It's shameful. Just kidding. Fuck that dominatrix attack. <laughs> We're fighting fire with fire now, honey. Happy fucking holidays, bitches. <laughs> What's happening in the I don't Loesch? know. <laughs> that was a good I am, though. Yeah, I don't know. Space Bear, I'd like to thank Matt for keeping the MR Spotify list playlist updated. I listened to nothing else for two weeks, and now my Discover Weekly playlist is fresh and groovy. Thanks, Matt. Two of our three routes take you through Ohio. You can stop by and say hi to Cliff, says Space Bar. Unionized uh, day. Hey, I'm Mark Crew. I've been listening for a bit over a year now, and I want to thank y'all so much for helping me get through the horrific spectacle of this proto-fascist Trump era. I started a new job with an actual decent wage, so I've finally signed up as a member. I used to do just two bucks on Patreon. I'm now glad to make a full $10 uh, contribution. Thank you. Anyway, can I get a blast of that sweet horn for the chosen people? Oh, sorry. Yeah, here we go.
I got to say that bringing a fellow anarcho-communist onto the show really helped me get across the membership line. I just couldn't not be a member anymore after hearing that. I can't wait to hear more from Jamie and Pat. Uh, uh, you're welcome. And Pat, in quotes. <laughs> You'll be hearing a lot more of my fash bashing transhumanist wobbly ass. Believe me, stay rad, unionized AI. I don't think uh, Pat likes the Pat jokes, dude. Leon Gittins. I didn't say that one. Uh, so now this crazy... I had already gotten past the Patrick thing, but... Uh, Leon Gittins. So now this crazy Tory government is seriously thinking about leaving the EU without a deal. That will be a disaster for the UK. Theresa May has convened an emergency sit-down with Michael Boehner, Barnier, the uh, chief negotiator for the EU. She's scrambling around to try and move these negotiations on and break the deadlock. But even though it looks gloomy, we're still a million miles away from what I hear you guys in the U.S. Uh, hear about you guys in the U.S. We are See, at least, you have no idea how to pronounce that. We, we are, all make mistakes. We are not. We are at least are not threatening nuclear war with North Korea or invading Iran. Still have our own universal health care, and we have our own Bernie, Jeremy Corbyn, just waiting to form the next socialist government in the U.K. Life doesn't seem that gloomy over here. Leon of London. Alan... Uh, a Yende fangirl. Hi, Sam. I just watched National Rational's most recent video on your <laughs> Keep it with him. I think he misses your point on a fundamental level because he doesn't consider the implications of what the popularization of Jimmy's accelerationist ideas does to the material conditions of people he claims to care about. Uh, under a Republican-controlled government, uh, the point, uh, poor people, people with disabilities, people of color, unions, I would add to that, people who need health care, uh, I would add to that. Sam, just because someone doesn't read CBO reports for fun doesn't mean I they don't have say, a right to comment on politics. I would say... Yeah, I've he got, speaks to emotions, you speak to the head, but you're on the same side. So maybe I you would, should get over your ego and the fact that you have half his YouTube <laughs> I would, that's like the part I love it. It's all like, he's the real socialist. Now, if you weren't so fucking jealous of his numbers, <laughs> like everything gets reduced to that metric. It's pretty funny. Um... The uh, the cuts that we've seen in housing, in um, pro bono work for criminal defense. I mean, I just on and on. Well, my wife would have done the same thing. The point that irritated me the most when he says in his new video that Jimmy gets upset about real injustice is you only seem to have this passion for arguing with Jimmy who shares your politics. I mean, that's somewhat irrational, but uh, Jimmy might have the same policy positions as you, but if he's never willing to vote for someone that could be pushed into signing those policies into law, then who gives an F? I don't know. In other words, Jimmy's more performative about stuff than I am. He's more of a showman, and that's what's really upsetting. Uh, I don't know if it's worth further arguing with him if he refuses to admit four years of Trump better than eight years of Hillary mindset is damaging to marginalized people and no one who espouses my political ally. It, well, I think uh, I think he's not, and I will say this because he's my patron, but I do think he's legit. Uh, yeah, the rational national. I think all he's trying to say is that uh, it, the best case scenario you can make for him is that he's trying to say that, that, that people with that position, you will persuade more easily through empathizing with them versus calling them fucking idiots. Oh, but no, the, no, no. But the no, response no, 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 to that no, no, is no, you're no. not calling those not, people. You're calling one very specific. Yeah, I'm not trying to convince Jimmy of anything. I think he's an idiot. And I can't go into his brain and make his brain function. Okay? I can't. I can't do that. But this is like the ether track but, of YouTube but, bullshit. I can help you. With I that. can explain. Uh, yeah, you want some help with that? I Maybe can we explain could to other other him. people using Jimmy as an example of politics that are stupid. But I think if you at times what we did during the, it, it got annoying because people came at us with so much dumb dumb shit. But we would say like, we get it. Hillary's horrible. Haiti, Honduras, welfare, environment. And then go from there. And then I think in the course of getting subjected to so much of that nonsense, it just, we stop dropping, doing the qualifiers and just being like, look, you got to grow up, Supreme Court. Yeah. I mean, there were two choices on the ballot. There were two choices on the ballot. One of those two people were going to win. If you did not believe that one of those two people were going to win on the day you went in to cast your ballot, then you're, you're just a dumb dumb. 
And yeah. and and if you have some theory of change, if he had some theory of change, I'd like to hear it. The the funniest part is just that his theory of change is we're going to show the Democrats, we're going to teach them a lesson. And then the day that Hillary Clinton loses, he's like, don't blame us. What? I thought that was the whole theory of change that you were going to send a message. Well. Meanwhile, Rachel Maddow is trying to have us out right. into a war with Russia, and you don't have a single right. word to say about then it. Then it becomes it about how evil it Chris is Hayes disgusting. is. You know, Chris Hayes was covering those Facebook ads, and I hope you're happy when we have World War III. Uh, Isn't Chris Hayes disgusting? <laughs> you see what he said about Susan Sarandon? Have, Doesn't that piss you off, uh, Chris Hayes? It's how, many, my, how many dollars does it take to sell out, Chris? How much does it take to demonize Susan Sarandon? Hayes has, uh, there is a program at MSNBC where you can sign up and you get like a bonus and they give you extra pudding at the commissary if you <laughs> knock, um, if you knock any. Academy yeah, I know he wrote a popular treatment that. of the colony inside the nation and the most robust treatment of police violence in the Carsical state against African-Americans. And guess what? I don't care. Did you hear what he said about Susan Sarandon? He confronted her on his program about accelerationist arguments. Disgusting. <laughs> Total sellout. Hate Chris Hayes. <laughs> so in Montana, we have three carriers on the exchange. Two didn't factor in losses of CSRs, and one did with a 27% rate increase. So the two companies that didn't factor in loss of CSRs won't be able to refile rates. So they'll be, they will pull plan leaving one carrier on the exchange in Montana. My sister owns a business and got a subsidy, and we will see her premium go up 400 a month. This will kill people in rural states. We'll kill them. Also, yesterday I was watching Face the State, and farmers here are super nervous about pulling out of TPP, NAFTA, and about SNAP reductions because 80% of the farm bill is for food programs. Stop those programs, and farmers sell their grain to whom? Farmers are flippable, and these issues will only be magnified. I hope they quit voting against their own best interests. I mean, it doesn't matter if Joe and Ray down the block want to get married if they're losing their farm. Dems get out of here and work these folks. Get out here and work these folks. Trump's got to make uh, a buck. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I get that. I don't know if Montana is really the the goal. But in Pennsylvania, there's, I mean, there's a whole lot of set of policies. I mean, right now, like, truckers getting screwed big time. Big, big time. Um, particularly independent truckers. Uh, tr Trump's got, I don't know why I think of like Pennsylvania truckers, but just because that Route 80 is long. Although I wouldn't take that coming from <laughs> Vegas. I would go you were south. so fast on that. Like, we Great, show today. Great show today. These companies need to have their day in court, but how can we attack the legality of non-disclosure in sealed files? Also, you guys should try and get Michael Hart on the, on the show about his new book, Assembly. He talks about how the left should think about power and how to build lasting, strong institutions that aren't hierarchical in nature. Like Empire, that book held up real well, sure. Michael Hart. Michael Hart. You remember those uh, that, that trilogy? Michael Hart and Antonio Negri. Did we have them on? No, that was I don't I think they still started coming out before you remember. started your show. It was like Empire, Multitude, Commonwealth. Very uh, interesting I books. Feel like Commonwealth I wanted to Commonwealth might have been a multitude I know Naomi Klein was into. Umar Shami, uh forgive me if you've already answered this on Friday. A while back you had your show interview with uh, that touted the system they have in Denmark and multiple times you cited it as the happiest place on earth. New Kelly advocated the elimination of capitalism on Thursday with no pushback. Uh, Denmark has capitalism to create wealth and socialism to more equitably distribute the wealth and prevent human beings from being ground up in its machinery. Hypothetically, if she had the power of revamping Denmark, what would she do in addition to eliminating capitalism that would make it even happier? Why reinvent the wheel when we seem to have an excellent model in Denmark that, what, that your own show had touted in the past? Mm. Jamie? I mean, I don't... <laughs> Oh boy. I don't think I know enough about Denmark's specific situation to mm. really comment on in an informed way here. Can I and, back and, Amy up? And then why wouldn't you comment in that instance? 
Uh, Just because you don't know enough about like, it, you uh, got to yeah. understand what's going on here. I mean, <laughs> I have an overarching theory and worldview, but uh, in Denmark's case specifically, I'm willing to bet that there are still problems in Denmark. Can I give uh, Jamie two potential pieces of backup? On Denmark? On Denmark. Well, it's not, it's just, what, all of those social Euro, social democracies in Europe have been getting trimmed under austerity and right-wing governments. So as long as capitalism is in play, those arrangements are always threatened. And then you can argue, I guess, like a place like Denmark or any other Western place is dependent on a world system which is unequal and in, it contributes to exploitation in developing countries. So you can't just look at it in isolation. And that, I think, was what Jamie was trying to say. Yeah. In a certain sense. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I mean, most of what I know about Scandinavian social democracies, I learned from The Knife, uh, which is What's a, the knife? a band from uh, Sweden, I want to say. You know, one of those countries. And they are, you know, pretty pretty woke, pretty radical. They seem to think there's still problems there. So uh, I, well, I'm going to Well, of course. I'm all the, it's all like, it, there's all the no-go cities. In, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Disco Stew story out of Minnesota where parents of a high school volleyball team berated opposing players from a mostly Latino high school because the teenage girls kneeled during the anthem. The girls left the game in tears as they were heckled by adults. The crowd Does that really jeered, surprise you? jeered them with the chance of USA, USA, and parents yelled at them during the anthem. One parent quoted by the local paper espoused thinly veiled dog whistle racism. Trumpism is over is empowering these people. That's just one story of several of the last week with the high school kids are on the receiving end of Trump style bigotry. Yeah, I spoke to some family members in the Minneapolis that live in the Minneapolis area. They were out here and the uh, high school environment politically since Trump won. Like the schools have been very divided. Like it's it's crazy out there. Well, also the large uh, Somali immigrant population is probably also like giving those folks like a like fodder. Before that, it was the Hmong community that they were really paranoid about. <coughs> Calling from a seven six five area code. Who's this? Hi. Um. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Mario from Indiana. Uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, elaborate on the whole uh, Jimmy Reefer cake song from last Friday. Um, so what happened was in, uh, when Mulan came out in 1998, McDonald's released a uh, special edition uh, Szechuan sauce for the McNuggets. And then um, in April, Rick and Morty uh, brought it up in that episode. And um, I guess that created a lot of nostalgia for people. So uh, when McDonald's said that they're going to um, bring that back as a like limited edition, um, people, a lot of people went uh, kind of like when the new iPhone comes out, got in line, and then a lot of people couldn't uh, get the sauce because there was such high demand for it. Um, and then um, I guess uh, a lot of like the people who couldn't get the the uh, sauce uh, got pretty pissed about it. And then that's why Jimmy Reefer Cake is saying, "I look at everything that's uh, going on, but you guys are pissed because you couldn't get a, a packet of sauce." There was a kid who went viral, like really pissed about this. I forget what city he was. Yeah. In, well, I should have. I'm sorry. Really I should have probably done this. Um, when you were about to tell us that, but I appreciate that update on the <laughs> the definitive update on the Szechuan sauce. I also had multiple people um, email as to um, condemn mine and extol Jamie's pronunciation of Szechuan. So, um, and uh, this weekend on Michael Brooks show, the illicit history is also going to be on this episode. We're going to get a guest in. So, yeah, on Szechuan, on the, on the, the yes, that's right, the Rick and Morty incident, exactly. Interesting. Thank you. I, if, I if I could, uh, well, just one last thing, if I could. Um, sure. This is something I saw on Facebook when this whole thing was going on. So this is obviously from, from a right winger. So this is a, a, a tweet from a while ago. Um, he tweeted um, in reply to, I don't know what was going on, but he said, that whole generation is the snowflake. I need a safe space. Don't stand for the national anthem. Pussification of America. Uh, disgraceful. 
But then when he couldn't get his uh, sauce, his Szechuan sauce, he tweeted at McDonald's in reply, thanks for wasting a full tank of fuel to going to multiple multiple McDonald's for a fucking sauce that couldn't get any of them. You just lost a customer. That is the most bitch made tweet I've ever heard in my and life. And you can't find that at the supermarket Szechuan sauce? I think it was a special Szechuan something or other. Who knows? We put twice the amount yeah, of sugar so they, in they, it. Yeah, they yeah really, basically. They, yeah. I appreciate the call. Right, thank well, you. Well, thank you guys. Great job. Thanks. Thanks. I'm glad. I am glad somebody called in with that because this was driving me nuts. So this is like not remotely as important as that, but a car bomb in Malta just killed one of the Panama paper journalists. Jesus. Yeah. Daphne Karuna Galizia, a blogger whose investigation focused on uh, corruption, was described as a one-woman WikiLeaks. She was, yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. Where was she from? I think so. I believe she was from Malta. No, what um was she just was she a blogger? Was she a They th- identify her as a blogger and she was instrumental in the whole Panama Papers uh investigation. So she collaborated with The Guardian, I think was the collaborator, but I don't remember specifically what facilitated the Panama Papers. I don't know what group was behind that. Wow. But she led the Panama Paper investigation. Wow. She led it. Jesus. Yeah. That's scary. And she has just the Malta's prime minister is actually fairly there's a lot of corrupt allegation corruption allegations around him and uh her you know she he she pointed at him directly so. Wow. Bad. Um Yeah. Speaking of uh, not great. Here's um Still dealing with the fallout of the decertification or the intention to decertify the Iran deal. And remember the background on this. The, the deal must be certified every 90 days, which was set up in such a way that theoretically Hillary Clinton would uh, there'd be an opportunity for um, for those who are against the idea of making peace with Iran or at least getting into some type of like. Um, peace probably is too strong of a word. Just in any way dealing with Iran, this was going to be their way of 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 always having this fallback. Well, we still got a 15 days going to sign again or whatever it is. And now uh, they're bummed by it. Donald Trump decertifying it was sort of like a a bone to throw Donald Trump. It now goes back to the House, uh, where I should say to the Congress where um, they could theoretically scuttle the deal. They won't necessarily. They could. And this is the, well, let's hear Nikki Haley, who I have to say, I haven't seen too many interviews with her. And she is not that impressive in articulating the situation. We're not saying they're in breach of the agreement. What we're saying is that of the thing, of the sites inspected, no, they're doing exactly what they claim to do, but all sites but haven't been inspected. decertifying implies that they're not in compliance. No, decertifying implies that all of those other things that are in the U.N. resolution are not happening. Those are total violations. They are violating every single one of them. So this Pause is it. U.S. law. Is- Understand what she's saying here. We have a deal. The deal encompasses, we have an issue set. The issue set is this. The deal encompasses this the smaller part of that issue set, a subset, if you will. And that subset is nukes. And she's saying, yes, they've been fine on the deal we made, but on the deal that we didn't make, they haven't been doing any of the things that we want them to. So we're decertifying the deal that we did make because there are other things that bother us about them that we haven't yet made a deal about. So it's back to the original complaint which was, hey, you made a deal about nukes, but you didn't make a deal about the other stuff. Wherein the Obama administration said, that's right. We set out to make a deal about nukes because that's of paramount importance. Because they're nukes. 
and also, if anything, if you look into this, I mean, the Iranians are have been much more interested in a broad-based agreement than us. Of course. That of we course. and the partners were very specific about limiting it. So not of only course. are we lying on it, it's our own parameters that we primarily set up. Of course. And it makes sense to deal with the most dangerous part. Of course, Iran wants a full... They, of course, they don't like... We, we want to be the pariah of the world. We want to have all sorts of obstacles towards uh, enhancing our economy and to growing and to, and to providing. For, we want all that because it gives us a nice sense of like it, it justifies our sense of oppression. No, of course not. But uh, Nikki Haley is trying to and not doing a very good job of like, you know, this is the stuff you can get away with if you go on to like Sean Hannity's program. But if you actually ask anybody who's actually asking any uh, questions, you should go prepared to make an argument. But she doesn't. She's all over the place. One of them. So this is U.S. law is not just part of the agreement. U.S. law talks about everything else. And it's good that it does. They're not they're not violating the four corners of the nuclear deal. Well, I think right now we're saying no. As far as we see, they are in compliance of that part of it. But what we're saying is, is America still safe? Are we still okay with them doing all of these other bad things? And what you're seeing is everybody is turning a blind eye to Iran and all of those violations out of trying to protect this agreement. What we need to say is we have to hold them accountable. They can't be continuing to support terrorism around the world like we are seeing they do. They can't continue to test ballistic missiles, which will lead to a nuclear Iran. They can't continue to do arms smuggling in the way that they're doing. Are we really ready to have them become a North Korea? Are we going to allow that to happen? What? See, this is so convoluted. She's basically saying, like, we need to take... It's like literally like picking up like a nuclear warhead and saying, I'm going to use this as a hammer to build this thing because we need to build this ship. Are we could just going to oh protect the nuke over there and not build this thing. The whole point is that I mean, it's in by the end of that one statement, she could she 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 contradicts herself multiple times. And like I say, this is fine for Hannity. And it's fine to go. But, you know, at one point, Nikki Haley, she took this job because she wants to run for president. At one point, she's going to have to talk to normal people because she just doesn't have the ability to sell the same measure, uh, level of bigotry that Donald Trump did. She's Marco Rubio. She's basically Marco Rubio. Right. Which I mean, also, it's just neo I would also con, say the same neo problem with uh, Marco Rubio. Bloviating. Like, you're going to actually have to pretend you can talk to normal people. Because you're going to lose at least, you know, 10, 15 percent of uh, that, you know, racist fervor that you have. Nikki Haley is going to have to go around with the sign saying, like, I'm not Mexican <laughs> just to communicate to the Republican base. Yes. See if that works for them. Also, for what it's worth, I mean. They are doing. They do some terrible things in that region, and there's some bad human rights violations inside Iran. But like the notion, especially if you're going to be out there framing that ISIS is the main thing, that Iran is not basically synchronized with us on that. Well, but here's the they're, point. They're the she primary said, we people. We don't want Iran to become the next North Korea. Well, that's also North that's Korea a whole other level is of defined insane. by the fact that they have nukes. Right, but that's a whole other. Although. The parallel is actually in some ways with North Korea. We've broken our agreements. I mean, I was going to say, yeah, if you, yeah, that's if the you, parallel. I mean, if you, if you, I mean, that, that's, that's what's in Libya, you know, Gaddafi had his right. own, you know, I'm going to dismantle everything. Well, he did. He did. Well, he barely, I mean, that didn't work out. Well, that's the lesson, right? The Supreme, the, uh, the Khamenei said he gave permission to Rouhani and Zarif to negotiate. And he said something like, you can do as you, it was some type of very ambiguous, like you can do as you wish, but I do not trust America ever. And and then Trump came along and just said, Supreme Leader in a certain sense, he had a great point. Um, big story out about uh, Mike Pence, we'll probably talk about this uh, more, but um, it is uh, the worth- The important parts just, more. Now we'll just get to the, right, to get the to fun the fun stuff. parts. So uh, apparently Donald Trump, you know, I 
I moderated a panel uh, of the President Show at Comic Con last week, and I think that video is up now, actually. Um, and the dynamic between Anthony Animatek and Peter Gross, uh, who play Trump and Hyde Camp. Um, <laughs> you say Anthony's last name. Oh, I have no idea. I'm going right, to try. I can, um, the guy who does Trump. And I had to have it out like phonetically when he yeah. came on to the. The dynamic is, you know, sort of where you would go comedically where, you know, Trump like berates him and slaps him around. And, and um, but like a lot of stuff from that show, it turns out to be so spot on that it really almost doesn't qualify as parody uh, anymore. Here is some uh, some clips from apparently, um, according to the uh, New Yorker, Trump likes to to let uh, Pence know who's boss. That's a quote. Staff member from Trump's campaign recalls him mocking Pence's religiosity. He said that when people met Trump after stopping by Pence's office, Trump would ask, did Mike make you pray? <laughs> Two sources also recalled Trump needling Pence about his views on abortion and homosexuality. And the best part about this is this is like classic Trump because he's making fun of Pence, but he's wrong. During a meeting with a legal scholar, Trump belittled Pence's determination to overturn Roe v. Wade. The legal scholar had said that if the Supreme Court did so, many states would likely legalize abortion on their own. You see, Trump asked Pence, You've wasted all this time and energy on it, and it's not going to end abortion anyway. <laughs> he doesn't get that, like, it will eliminate it from states around the, the country, and that's just the first step to making a law. Yeah. Much energy all wasted. And then when, an when the conversation turned to gay rights, Trump motioned toward Pence and joked, don't ask that guy. He wants to hang them all. Even Elton John. Am I right? I mean, that guy's crazy. I still picked him as my... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I don't actually care, but he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the only How come you're starting that campaign thing, Mike? What's that about? Speaking why are you, of hanging people. Why are you raising money to run for office? I don't get it. Uh... The only thing Trump is good at is owning Republicans. That's like yeah. his core. <laughs> it's his best he's, skill. He's completely coherent and like he sees very clearly when he looks at like a Republican apparently. See I wonder exactly what is, who you does are. he not have a nickname for Pence? That I find hard to believe. Hangman. That must be like keep, keeping it like Hangman. Praying guy. Pencil dick. <laughs> Pray for a bigger dick, Mike. Penis face. <laughs> Something, I feel like it's, like something, face feel like it's something that, that, that it's got to be so bad that they're not putting it in the. New I York. just come Jesus freak. Mike's de minimis penis. <laughs> calling from a 610 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, Sam. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Who's this? This is Stephen. I'm calling from Pennsylvania. Oh. I've called the show uh, a few times, but never when you were hosting. So good on you, I guess, for being exactly where you would have been anyways. <laughs> Fair enough, um, Steve. So, yes, yes. So um, I just I just want to start with a few things. First of all, just a few. I kind of like where the, I, I kind of like where this Jimmy Dore debate is going because it it, it, it kind of has now shifted to something a little bit more policy oriented in, in the sense that like we're pointing out. Um, you know, why it's important to care about these things, I guess, before it was more just like a feud. But um, so I watched a video. I'll, I'll try and keep this as short as I can. Um, I watched a video you you um, did called, I think it was called, um, um, Why Do You Argue With People On Your Side? And you kind of addressed this, this feud a, a little bit more generally. And you said, you know, yeah, like, um, you got to care about these things like the broader issues with the judiciary. Um, and that's why it matters. And, and I just kind of wanted to add to that and just kind of show how deep that argument goes and talk about it in the context of, 
where I live and my local election coming up. Um, mm -hmm. So I have this written down. I'll, I'll read this part, and if you want to respond off air, that's fine. Okay. Um, so I live in Palmer Township in Northampton County. Um, Hillary lost um, my county by 5,400 votes about. Um, I found it interesting when I looked at the electoral map, we're, we're kind of sandwiched between um, – a few different blue counties, except for Carbon County, which I'm sure you can imagine, like that's more um, red country. It's it's like coal country. Um, but but yeah, we're we're mostly kind of surrounded by areas that are more blue. Um, so Anne Marie Pinella is running for re-election as Palmer supervisor. She's a Democrat and has held this position since 2001, and I noticed that the same people that just last year had Trump Pence signs out on their lawns are putting out signs in support of her uh, of her opponent, Zeke Bellis. Um, and I wanted to look into it and see if like if there's something more than just like, you know, you're staying within your own party, more or less. Um, I wanted to find out if there was like a particular like a divide between these two candidates. Um, and then firstly, I, I found it pretty hard to find information about this. I mean, at, at a right. local level, well, it's right. just... Yeah, yeah. You gotta, we got to get, the, we gotta get to the point. I can't do a, a whole uh, essay okay. on this. Well, I mean, so what is it? So uh, okay. you've got, okay. you've got um, local races, uh, Republicans are supporting Republicans, and you wanted to know why. Yeah, and, and now I'll, I'll get to the main thing. So um, what I was able to find out was Anne-Marie Pinella approved the construction of an apartment complex that's not far from where I live, um, and people are freaking out that it's going to draw in a lot of low-income families. And, and keep in mind, like, where I live, is, it's, in, it's very suburban, you know, upper middle class, really, okay. for the most part. Like, the, the area's... Okay, okay, okay. So, that. yeah, so she's bringing in low-income housing. Right. And, and I, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate your point that, you know, voting, it's not just the broader set issues like like you see on TV, like it's just kind of like Hillary, Trump, Republican Party, Democratic Party. There's more nuances than that. And it does affect people on a local level. So that's that, that's all I wanted to reiterate. These that's people, a good point. Like, they don't that's even true. want to be sympathetic to um, anyone that's of a lesser economic status than that. Okay. Pre appreciate the call. Good point. Well, sorry, you went around, you circled around it a lot before you got there, but it was a good point at the end. Call from 509 Area Code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, this is Ronald Reagan's creepy uncle. Uh, I, uh, I really wanted to uh, talk about, um, you know, theory of change and how to get the message out about uh, Social Security and Medicare, but I'm a little upset about that Szechuan sauce now. Um, I, uh, I'm uh, really upset about the chance that I could have had to have that again. Um, <laughs> neither. I mean, priorities. Uh, back to, uh, I, I mean, I signed up for Protect Our Medicare and Social Security Benefits, um, the NCP SSM. Um, and actually, nobody uh, will let me put a poster up in their window, which was amazing. Uh, That's weird. And they all said... Uh, yeah, though they didn't want to be partisan. I mean, I, I, you know, I try to explain Social Security. That's not really a partisan thing. That's for everybody. But it, that just kind of goes back to the idea of like. But you know what? I mean, like, the bottom line is Social Security is partisan. I mean, uh, uh, in 1936, uh, the Republican Party w had dedicated themselves to destroying Social Security. And uh, if they have the opportunity now, they would also take it. I mean, so it is partisan. I mean, I, I don't think yeah. I don't think Democrats, frankly, uh, make it partisan enough because I think up until very recently, uh, up until very recently, I don't think they were as, um, you know, wedded to it as they should have been. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah, I can't get anybody to um, just acknowledge the fact that it, it benefits them as well. Uh, what, what about the I idea that, like, a... should we have pensions, guaranteed pensions? See if you could just make it oh, even yeah, more basic. Oh, yeah, they bring up the idea of, of oh, I paid in my 401K that's, you know, not going to work, but whatever. 
Um, so yeah, uh, back to the sauce. Is there is there any word on like are we getting the sauce back in McDonald's? We're working or? on it. We're working. The sauce on it. is the like Republican economics. It's a scam. Okay. There's not enough for everybody. The sauce thing. I don't know. The sauce, the sauce thing sauce. is like your 401k. It's not going to be there. Uh, two four five oh nines in a row. You call him from a five oh nine area code. Is this um? This is going to be Ronald Reagan's creepy uh, aunt now. No, this is just creepy Ronald Reagan. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, what's happening? Hey, oh, Ronald um, yes, sir. Yes. Well, I just wanted to say my my politics were also um, pretty rounded out and shaped by a Swedish band, uh, Ace of Base. <laughs> I don't know if you remember them, but. Oh, no, that's um, not good. All that she wants is worker control of uh, production. That's what that song's about. Um, now, Sam, you're familiar with uh, Laura Trump. I, I am familiar with Laura Trump. She is she's uh, Junior's wife or Eric's wife who does who does um, reality yeah. TV or something like that. Real TV. I am Eric. real news. Whatever. Yeah. Re- really news. So she. When she was uh, pregnant with Eric Jr., she told People Magazine that she was feeling really exhausted at the beginning of the, the pregnancy. And, I mean, I'd be exhausted, too, if I was pregnant with the spawn of Satan. Right. <laughs> have you seen Rosemary's Baby? Yeah, I have. It was a great movie. I mean, that's mu- that's that's mu- must be what it feels like to carry that critter around. I'm just going after Eric Jr., okay? That's what liberals are supposed to do these days, so... Um, Eric Jr. Know, was complaining kid. on uh, on Hannity that they've already started attacking. Uh, his, already his, started his baby. attacking my child. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm attacking Eric. Eric Jr. is the baby. That's who I'm attacking. Oh, I, I don't see. care I about see. Eric. Yeah, it's his baby. <laughs> they're attacking. They're, they're already attacking his baby. They, yeah, <laughs> the baby's a month old now, so I think he can handle himself. Um, Eric, uh, Eric. Senior told People Magazine that um, we really li- love the name Charlie, but we'd already named our dog that, so it's out. So instead of uh, they were going to go with the dog's name, but instead they named him after the biggest douchebag on the planet. So I mean, Dude, this baby you, sucks is what I'm trying to say. Are you getting are you getting <laughs> ready to, to go say, do open mic or what's going on? I feel like you're working your material with us now. Yeah, I just feel like. They're, they're you should be going to open mic to, to try out the material, not trying out the material here and then going to open You should mic. do a baby roast, though. Have like a baby <laughs> roast night baby and just roast <laughs> all of like the conservative people's babies. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think it's a really good idea. I like it. Um, since liberals are doing it anyways, you know, we're going after their babies. We might as well. Hey, how are you? How are you doing, Drumpf Jr.? <laughs> Hey, Sam, I have a real question for you. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit worried about the stock market because it does appear to be doing well. And this morning on my local talk, uh, talk radio, they were really uh, spiking the ball over the, uh, the stock market. And for people like you and me, uh, I don't think a moment goes by that we're not like conscious, consciously aware that Trump is president and he's ruining everything. But for a lot of people they can sort of float in and out of that or just yep. not spend any time in that headspace at all. And if we come around in November of next year and the market, the, you know, the market, which only a handful of people really benefit from, but if, if they can go around saying, look at what the market's doing, this is great. Um, you know, not that I'm hoping for a crash or something, but I, I guess I'm, I'm curious what is happening with the market? Why is it, no, um, I mean the, the guy who just won the uh, the guy the guy who just won the the Nobel Prize, I think uh, Thaler, right? He 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 does work on on specifically d- dealing with the stock market. He's like, I have no idea why it's going this high. I mean, I think there is. Um, I don't I don't know, and I can tell you that um, to the extent that I had any participation in the stock market, uh, like the day after. Um, he won. I was like, I'm out. Uh, and just because the whole thing seems gross to me and slash, uh, I don't, it's weird to me that, um, 
things would work out with someone who has no idea what they're doing uh, as president. <laughs> and and that just right. something seems wrong to me. I don't think from an electoral from in terms of like a midterm election. I have never seen any data about uh, how that correlates with the the stock market. Maybe there's some professor out there from some university who's like, I have the formula that to figure out what's going on with midterm elections based upon uh, the model I have suggests that the stock market's uh, you know up this percentage point than this. I, I've never even heard of something like that because I just don't think that midterm elections are going to be influenced that much about uh about the stock market like you say there's not enough people who participate in it i guess there's a lot of people who could see maybe their pensions uh would would be up but i'm also you know i think it's a shorthand for like things are good and, and i think even people who are i feel like after 2008 class, I, after 2007 that. that lesson like you don't see that as much like you know people forget but in the aughts you know, if you were on CNBC, that's you were a star. You know, Jim Cramer was a star. And now it's like, who's on uh, those business channels? Just people who are just basically just, you know, flogging uh, luxury cars to 10, 15, 20,000 people every hour. That's basically it. I, I just don't think that uh, the stock market's going up. And I think that there's a lot of people, maybe a lot, you know, there's a significant number of people who are like psyched about it and not trying to talk about it very much. Uh, but they're, they don't, they're not, they're not enough to make a difference in the polls. It seems to me. Uh, and the, the greater, what do you think the, what do you think the, what do you think the midterm message has to be at this point? Because I mean, Donald uh, Trump, I don't think we're going to, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think the message is Donald Trump. I'll give you Trump. the last word. Yeah, well, the, thank you. I appreciate this. The I would say um, we need to take control of uh, part of Congress to curb Donald Trump. That's the midterm message, you know, that people use all the time. We need to stop, um, the, you know, stop the Republicans. I mean, if, if the Republicans aren't able to pass anything, <laughs> Then, you know, the message is we need to curb Donald Trump. The Republicans aren't doing anything. And uh, this is a do nothing Congress. That's the message that the Democrats yeah. have. I mean, totally um, do nothing. they're not, you know, I mean, it's not like they can get anything else done uh, if they just control the House. Investigations, I would imagine, would be a part of that. It depends on where you're right. running. But um, some people may end up going like, we just need a balanced balance the government to get stuff done you know the old like the reason why we're not getting stuff done is because of incompetence as opposed to sort of like oh we have a massive disagreement in this country where 48 percent of the people uh think that we should be you know some type of nationalist fortress and screw over people and then another 48 percent think the opposite and then the other four percent in the middle are really more concerned about szechuan sauce so appreciate the call <laughs> yeah can I just say, I know he was joking about Ace of Base before, but uh, I've actually read some very convincing reporting that says Ace of Base uh, was a neo-Nazi yeah, band and snuck neo-Nazi imagery and ideology into mainstream pop music. I actually Jesus. think knowing, I think uh, knowing Ronald Reagan Ronald, on the uh, show. I think knowing Ronald Reagan, I think Explains he probably knew that and was making that joke. Really? Yeah. Maybe. No, because then he made a joke about how it was communist. Oh, with the uh, right. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Hmm. Maybe Boom. I'm giving him more Ronald credit. Ronald Reagan. Didn't one of the people? What didn't like the guy in Ace of Base? And Ronald Reagan, Reagan. so cool. Ronald Reagan is the coolest. He was making Antifa. Ronald jokes. Reagan supported was, Antifa before anyone ever heard such of a that. Great Antifa joke about Ace of Base. You know, there was Sick always when, when Ace of Base was like. Around though, like even in middle school, everybody was saying that they were Nazis. I got news for like, you. Like this was a rumor. I yeah. don't know who the hell Ace of yeah. Base is. What? Oh, come on, that was during your prime, Sam. <laughs> that was when you had a life. Ace of Base. That was like before we were in puberty. What you songs did you play? Me an Ace of Base song. Oh my, oh I my am, goodness, Sam, you went up and you 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 went and bought. I honestly some of your thought to this when music. I heard Ace don't of Base, lie. I thought it was those three. Yeah. 
white rappers. Wait, put it on. The f- uh, the- can I dance with you? I have Hello. Never. Is your name Ever Sarah Silverman? My oh my God! What's your number? Can I when call this, you? When were these playing? Hello. These guys are from the early '90s. Yeah. It was the first cassette tape I ever bought. Never heard these guys. Definitely in the never. early '90s. This is when you supposedly had a social life. So. I got news for you. I was not listening. I was not going anywhere. They played this music. Yeah, man. Everybody, come on. I swear to God. We, none of us were like even. I have never this heard out. this song in my entire oh, life. There's, that's literally impossible. Are you disabled in the musical part of your brain? No. Oh, dude, that's literally impossible. This was like so ubiquitous. I, I swear to you, I have never heard this song in my entire life. Hi, Sarah. Will you dance with me? No. I love I, this song. In, in, in the early 90s, I was going, it was for me, it was like Mud Honey and... Super chunk. I don't even know what any of that stuff is, but I'm just uh, saying, like, if you went to a club, you would have heard this, I'm sure. I never went to a club. I didn't go to clubs. You went anywhere. Like you would have heard it. There's no way you Dude, didn't hear this. I went to TT's. I didn't go to the grocery store. I was in Boston. All I right, went to right, TT's. Right, yeah. TT's, Middle East. Sure, you never heard uh, it. The Rat. The fact that you're so adamant that you never heard this I makes never heard me it. very suspicious. I, I didn't hear it. I thought this was from 2011. 2011. God, I don't want to hear it anymore. It's not good. <laughs> yeah, I like Matt. I like how Matt's secretly revealing he's actually a big Ace of Base I fan. Honestly, I honestly never I heard of that. I thought it was those three guys who were the rappers. One of them had like a, a like a cane. Like I can't remember his name now. Ace of Base. I'm convinced that. The, it, a cane. Can we do a new segment called Sam Explains Music? Like it was like a rapper, what was and then one of them had an eye patch, and then there was another one, and I thought that was Def Jam. No, what? It was something Ace. Talk about Scandinavian problems. It was white rap. <laughs> white rap. <laughs> Talking about Vanilla Ice. No. Eminem. Not House of Pain. No. MC Search. Nope. Oh, maybe it was MC Search. It might have been MC Search. But he, what? But he was an actual rapper. Yes. No. He was but, for real. What third base? That's what I thought it was. Third Somebody base. just I am me. Oh, third cool. base. Fair enough. I used to listen third base. Well, that's an ad, but fair enough. That's not embarrassing though that you listen to them. I'm not embarrassed by it. I just I no. I know. Heard, I'm just observing. I, honestly, it. third base is legit. It's disturbing to me when something that people think is so ubiquitous that I honestly don't think I ever heard that song in my entire life. Just goes that through. does honestly. Uh, wow. Okay. That's probably good. But I listened to a lot of music at that time. Early 90s, I listened to a lot of music. I would go out to, I was going out two or three times a week to go see shows. Story out of Minnesota, but it's all the same. Let's guys not invite Marin to this show. We'll have a good one. Story out of Showtime. Minnesota. We're parents of high school. Vo- oh, you did that. A DMC. Sam, I was afraid the Irish influence would wane with Kelly leaving, but then you go out and hire a Brendan and a Patrick. Now all we need to do is start calling Jamie Seamus. And it'll be like Friday night in the Emerald Isle in Worcester. Sweet. Uh, hello to all from the center of Hurricane Ophelia. Oh, man. Kevin Tampa. Sam, apropos of nothing, I'm trying to recall an interview that you did a few years ago, months ago, about how you, for years and years, well after the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was passed in 74 in some states, wives could still be denied their own credit cards, checking accounts, were required to have a husband as co-signer. Do you think that practice uh, might have persisted into the 90s? Do you remember who that interview was? I don't. I don't remember. I mean, I knew that was something I knew just from my own experience. I don't know who that might have come up with. But... um, I don't think that existed into the 90s, but I know that I remember my mom could not own a could not get a credit card without. And in fact, in Worcester at the time, you couldn't vote using your maiden name. Seriously? The city clerk. I mean, it was just a very curmudgeonly guy, but the city clerk was like, no. Right. Was that legal? I mean, for a lot, well, he was able to do it for a while. Uh, apparently, Doug fucking was legal. Clearly. And I mean, you you know, I, I mean, I imagine most people are aware of this, but I don't know if this is going to come as a surprise. But nobody referred to, like, my grandmother was, my grandfather's name was Samuel. My grandmother was known as Mrs. Samuel Cedar. Wow. 
You that's could, the sort of thing like I, I see that in first, print sometimes, like, but I've never heard like actually people using it. That's like the that. way it was. Like when I was when I was uh, like in elementary school, that that's how it really she is would refer to her herself on the phone. I would hear her say like, "This is Mrs. Samuel Cedar. This how is Mrs. You, this Donald is, Trump." Well, it was actually you, different how long have you worked to get uh, your wife to do that? Uh, um, you still in process? I refer to her that way. Yes. <laughs> Some people. I actually... come home. I'm like, "Hello, is Mrs. Samuel Cedar here?" <laughs> Some people actually made the checks out that way to me and my husband when we got married recently. It was super weird. Yeah. Like really? You, you don't know me at all. <laughs> that's got to be pretty. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's pretty. Oh, that's unbelievable. It's retro. Uh, call from an 814 area. Retro. Bring it's like Ace of Base. 814 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, Sam. <laughs> I am here. I'm a bit worried about you because your musical bo- voyage could be evidence of time dilation. <laughs> I'm well aware of that. Now, I have two points. I have two points. First off, Jimmy Dore and his supporters have an absolute duty, an obligation to speak up. Why is that, you may ask? Mm-hmm. That's because really. they don't want to comp they don't want to compound their ignorance with inaudibility. That's the uh, that's the first point. Now, second of all, Sam, it's good to see that you're journeying out from your cosmopolitan ivory tower there by the Gowanus Canal. Because in the heartland of America you might become acquainted with a a, a slight uh, a, a folk uh, folk tale or a folk theme which is that we, the unwilling, led by the unknowing, have done so much for so long with so little, little that we are now capable of doing almost anything over nothing. They, well, so I just thought you should... I, I, what happens to oh, Mandela is like needs lucky charms now. Right, I was going to say. <laughs> I don't know, they're all crossing over <laughs> to each other. It's very hard to oh, separate. Is this a right-wing leprechaun calling us? <laughs> what? <laughs> It could be a right wing or a leprechaun or some crazy uh, Scotsman. I don't know. I think what's Thanks funny, what I call, love, call thank you. Uh, what thank I love you. about his right wing Mandela is that sometimes he actually sounds like a like he sounds like a boar. <laughs> like he sounds like a proper white South African. <laughs> calling from a seven oh seven area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Logan. I'm calling from Sonoma. Uh, Logan from Sonoma. Yeah, that's correct. What's going on, Logan? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, How are you not guys much. Doing? The fires. Yeah, we're good. Uh, the fires have died down. It's still a bit smoky out in the air oh. uh, right now. You can definitely see the ash um, for sure in the sky. But um, it's uh, starting to get to a sense of, of normalcy uh, out here slowly, for sure. Glad to hear it. Um, but I'm calling for it. Yeah, for sure. I'm calling. I'm calling for a different different reason. Um, I think, I think one of the things that, that kind of gets lost and, you know, maybe it ties into the Jimmy Dore debate and, and things like that is, is this sense that a lot of people have that government can't do anything for them and that government isn't a useful tool anymore. And we, we seem to kind of constantly on the, both the right and the left support that message. I think actually your show does, it's one of the reasons I like it. does a good job of kind of pointing out the successes of government, especially when we argue with libertarians, pointing out the success of the EPA and the fact that really government is an organization of people and that that organization of people is, is the best defense that we have against really, really large institutions in the private sector that would seek to harm people that have no care for them. And I think, you know, I've watched a lot of friends go from being, you know, essentially Bernie Sanders supporters being really liberal to then going back and being Donald Trump supporters because they believe in the, you know, private capital side of things and that private industry is the answer if government is not. Um, And I think additionally, in addition to that, people that, you know, maybe would have stayed on that, that Sanders side, there's other people too that that just didn't vote at all. And people that would really benefit from government coming in and helping them continuously believe and buy into the narrative that, you know, 
government can't work. It doesn't work. It never has. It never will. And we seem to kind of purvey that throughout the media. I mean, yeah. government well, is I mean, listen, listen, I mean, is something we all agree, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, listen, this is the bottom line is even if you are anarcho, um, yeah, a smart anarchist understands that we're got to go through certain stages. And the fact right. of the matter is you cannot be a leftist, a non uh, anarcho leftist and deride state power broad, generally you, right. you you need to i mean right. it's one thing to say we need to limit it in certain areas because of civil liberties but to say that government can't right. function or to just you know his whole message of like the everybody sucks because they're not um because well whatever i mean he uh, apparently he's had videos right. criticizing criticizing the emotion showed in support of single payer like when this person said they supported single payer their mouth was turned down and they weren't smiling and that person was smiling we need everybody who in the saying it's smiling and like seriously did that that's not politics yep. that's like right. And well, I, I guess it's like high I think, school, I think like beyond, literally voting for a high school, right. you know, homecoming queen or something. Like I didn't like, the, you know, well, their, just just they beyond the together. beyond the right and beyond the Jimmy Dore thing and, and that whole element. Like there just needs to be a movement that says, you know what, like the like government is good. We need more government. I mean, here in the Bay Area, I've heard that basically Marin stopped the BART train from getting to the North Bay, and that's the point where. The, the state government should have stepped in and said, you know what, local government, you don't get to do that. That's nice that you have that opinion, but you don't get to do that because we need it more than you need not to have that. And, you know, we have to accept that, yeah, when we collectively organize as a large group of people, we can do better, we can be better, we can organize and help people better. I think I think large group of people can be worse, but are often better than, than small individuals, right? Like, not that many people individually donate to charity, but as a collective government, we can organize things like social security, welfare that actually help people. And it's just kind of sick to me to watch, you know, so many people not even vote, not even get involved, not even do anything about it. And I think a lot of that comes from the belief that nothing can change and that the government can't do anything right. And that's something, I mean, you watch Zoo, Zootopia, that stupid movie, the, the kids movie. I mean, where, where do the sloths work? They work at the DMV, right? It takes forever. There's bureaucracy. It's the same sort of thing that's constantly pervaded throughout society. And it's, it's not the truth. It's not right because I've, I've seen government work and I know that it's the only answer to the largest problems that we face. I agree with you. I appreciate the call. All right. Take care. Right. It sounded like he was disappointed. Like he, like he wanted to fight. Yeah, that was kind of funny. It's like, all right, fine, you agree. All right, I'm sorry. I don't have time for any more calls today, folks. People have been holding. I'll go through some IMs here. Oh, well, but before we got to do this uh, tweet, this is unbelievable. <laughs> it's one of those moments that, like, makes Twitter Twitter. So apparently, so this guy, Jason Rosane, I'm not sure, Rosane, Rosian. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I think, was he the guy who was in prison? Res yeah. I hope I'm wrong, but it looks to me as though Americans being held hostage in Iran were just abandoned by Do a real Donald Trump. That That is a um, response to the decertification, right? Basically saying, like, we're going backwards in our relations with Iran, not forwards. And then Hollywood Depp. Palm tree, palm tree, palm tree, me too guys, responds back. Obama never got anyone back. Oh, yeah, there was that one military turncoat at Guantanamo prisoners who rejoined ISIS. And then some dude, Eric Fakas, replied to both. Also, the guy whose tweet you're replying to, <laughs> who was, in fact, um, he held by Iran for what, like a year and a half or something? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, he was a journalist. And, and, uh, uh, and that was another major thing during the negotiations. They were like, how dare you? You're not doing anything to get this guy out. It was disgusting, blah, blah, blah. And then pretty shortly after the deal was concluded, the guy was released. Yes. So I don't like, I mean, I don't glorify Obama at all, but there definitely were instances like that where he'd be like, shut the fuck up. 
I'm working on something. And right. everybody would have a tantrum and then it'd be like, uh, right. say, if a hostage, if a hostage gets released and he's not a regular, uh, guest on Hannity though, wh- did you really free a hostage? That's right. <laughs> the host- exactly. Does he really even exist? <laughs> the, the Hannity hostage rule. <laughs> It's like, I appreciate Obama letting me out, but he's heading us down towards decline, and uh, Muslims are coming in, and uh, Iran's got a whole plan. He's part of it. Devil, you don't. I work at a hospital in a job that would be uh, likely phased out in the case of a single-payer system being implemented. I just wanted to pitch in with my personal experience, because we always come up in these debates. My department has been a hiring freeze since Trump took office. These jobs are not secure, regardless of what the government does or doesn't do. These jobs exist because of a lack of standardization creates inefficiencies. However, things will be standardized either through a single payer system or through big companies having more and more share of the market. Automation always also puts these jobs at risk. These jobs are going to go the way of the coal miner one way or another. Don't let the right wing use it to stop progress. MR member. Sam, does it make me look like a pajama boy that Nikki Haley grows a better five o'clock shadow than I do? What? And Bonara, I have screamed Merry Christmas at 13 different people this morning, and not one has greeted me back with Merry Christmas. This war is deadly. The reason I tune in for the show is for detailed oral histories of McDonald's chicken thing dipping sauces. Show far. On the right, they're trying to purge their rhinos and ninos, Nazis in name only. Randy boy, Gorka sounds like Stewie from The Family Guy to slow down rate. I want someone to trick him into saying, Will Wheaton. Gorka loves him. Vaney. Oh, come on. Also, Sam, uh, d- definitely heard, overheard Ace of Base being played over the bathroom speakers at the local glory. Oh, okay. <laughs> SSL. Uh, saw that. Prof, uh, you're a troll. Nick from Manitoba. Great show today. Great interviews. Good producers. Uh, producers, good job, too. Thanks for reminding us the show is live. Hey, what do Michael Mondays and TMBS have in common? Great socialist political commentary by Shop 5%. My guess is as to why the stock market is going up is that with the Republicans in power, isn't it a reaction to the government of business and Wall Street elites working for these interests and thus a sign of good times? Well, look, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of deregulation yeah. across the board uh, that I think is 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 driving up and i think frankly i think they've baked in a lot of the the tax reform i mean if you know that your capital gains taxes are going to be cut um you're just going to pour money into the stock market i talked to a guy after the election so disgusting he pretty much was just like I don't remember exactly how he put it, but it was like, on one hand, probably highly more, much more likely the whole world blows up. On the other hand, it's going to give me more money. Yep. So I'll take it. <laughs> I think Jiminy, that's how they think it was just having another Republican in definitely. office. Definitely. You know, that's it. A- Why not? Absolutely. Jiminy Jersey. I just talked to a friend of mine who works in finance in a major institution in NYC into listening to your recent episode about modern economic policy with Stephanie Kelton. He wasn't fully convinced by the interview, so he followed, her, uh, uh, he followed up with her source material. A couple days later, he tells me he's convinced of her arguments and ideas and have been looking for a way to express them for a while. More importantly, he'll be incorporating this analysis into his work product, which can make for some real changes in how investors operate. just wanted to thank you for packaging arguments and ideas like this so we can reach out at an individual level and change minds. Sometimes the mind you change uh, can have real impact on policy. Major f- finance at a major institution. Wonder what that is. It's maybe Jamie Dimon. He ain't Jimmy Dore. <laughs> yeah, that's who you hate so much. Jay Shivone, I just totally drove through Ohio when I, dr- I drove to Phoenix as a young man. Uh, my route based on a trip tick provided a, a triple A, but what do I what do they know? What a giveaway. Sam says Rosemary's Baby was a great movie. Guess who directed that movie? Mm. <laughs> Sweden has a huge public program uh, to develop musicians and music production. They learned a valuable lesson from the effect that ABBA had on the domestic economy. Thus, Ace of Base is a welfare queen. Jimmy Durr. Uh, after this Las Vegas to New York by way of Ohio by Brink's truck fiasco, I think it's worth chewing over whether Sam has Parkinson's. <laughs> Tommy from, <laughs> from NH. <laughs> This is behind the curve since uh, Trump v. NFL is ancient history, but I've yet to hear anyone connect a few important do- uh, dots. 
Uh, dumb old Trump wanted to buy his way into the big boys club back in the 80s, but the owners wouldn't have him. Instead, as a one-third pony he is, he used the USFL as a litigation vehicle and was okay with killing the then nascent league for an opportunity to elbow his way in. Check out the doc- documentary Spall Potatoes for the whole story. I get it. Jill Stein turned Sam down at a disco circa 19- 1992. Now it all makes sense. Attorney Sorry, Andrew. I'm just not interested. <laughs> Please leave me alone. But I want you, Dr. Stein. I want a Green New Deal. You have to be a doctor. You, you're not part of my Green New Deal. I'm going to get revenge against you and Jimmy Dua and everyone. Attorney Andrew, I'm certain that I'm responsible for about 50% of the Jimmy Dora references. However, <laughs> I am responsible for 50% of the Joy Ann Reed references and to all the Pod Save America references. I will never apologize for my extremely useful contributions to the show. Also, Sam, what felt worse, Andy Kindler stealing your airtime on MSNBC or the Sox being crushed by the Astros so hard you had to fire your manager? I mean, I, I wouldn't say so hard. They all, I mean, it's not inconceivable. They, they should have won that third game, uh, that fifth game. And they left, like, what, like 12 on base. But, yeah, I never got an answer from him. Uh, I don't know what was up with Andy Kindler. Lastly, have you seen Bill O'Reilly's venture into politics? Turns out that per O'Reilly's Twitter, his corgi, Holly, is against athletes taking a knee, near, a knee during the anthem. Quoting Bill, Holly would never take a knee during the anthem, even if she had knees. Even if she had knees. She also doesn't like sexual harassment laws either. <laughs> She's a fucking great dog. Don't link. Saturday, I turned 73. Been following you since Air America. I listened to you during the mammogram, on the treadmill, bike, sauna, gym, waiting for treatment in the ER, shopping at Costco, waiting for my dog during a surgery, everywhere else I go. It's nice to have MR begin my day. I'd much rather hear about the presidential tweets from you than anyone else. Thank you for helping me maintain some sanity with information and facts infused with levity. Seven-minute video, A Night at the Garden documentary resurrects chilling 1930s Nazi rally in New York City. Wow. Creepy. Um, all right, a couple more IMs and we'll get out of here. Lock Dog. Lepaco smacked down the Rational National. He did a good job standing up for you, Sam. Oh, well, thank you, uh, the Lepaco. Jamie, does Sam shame you every day for not donating 50 a month to Cory Booker? He screams at me and I get scared. What? In, I'm reporting about Polly Psych. Sean Illing repeated the idiotic claim that civics is no longer taught in U.S. public schools. He pointed to the fact that only nine states require an English-only citizenship test for graduation. If you've taken that test, it's idiotic and pro- proves no proficiency. All 50 states require civics coursework for graduation. 37 require proficiency. This is my question, though. Where did this trope come from? Private school educated commentators who didn't learn civics and just assume that's the case elsewhere? Or is it just an excuse uh, for ballot suppression? I don't know. I think it's also maybe people seeing the general ignorance about civics in yes. society and just assuming. You got to have Tula Connell on, author of Conservative Counter Revolution, about how capitalism will always ally with far right reactionaries to attack public power and democracy in the workplace especially in the democracy identifies as socialist. We write that down? Tula Connell. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jamie is totally on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Staten Island Mike, the app is kind of annoying. Man, I stopped listening for a couple of weeks, and there's a new ovarian American, which was unexpected, but the colors all suck, which is totally expected. Staten Island Mike, very curmudgeonly. The ta- Thames Darwin, red as Gorka. Steve has the best slime around. All you pajama boys <laughs> know it. It's totally a different level from the beta cucks who can only make flume. Steve's so cool. That's what was in the the, the jacuzzi tub. All right. <laughs> Six more. It's to Kyle. Sarah Bell. I'm working. Uh, I'm liking the MR app so far. I thought I'd try it since AIM is going away and it works all right. Boom. Isha. Jamie is awesome. Now, what does she suggest we do for the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution? I don't know. It's going to be lit, though. I, uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> totally working on it. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, lit promised. Rob Details Cully. Not. That was very Trump. It's going to be lit. It's going to be lit. To add to the frustration of Jimmy is that his wife is a teacher. Well, she's about to lose... Um, um, uh, 
her union's about to suffer a massive blow because of the Supreme Court. Not as massive as it would have been under my wife. <laughs> Bernie or bust, just like Jamie says. Sensor sweep. Sammy, I know you're skilled with a five-blade razor with precision trimming blade, but are you much more intensive trimming? Well, I don't get it. Oh, my folks have two apple trees that have had very minimal pruning since the 90s, but it's more of a 70s level uh, overgrowth. What's the best time to trim? After the leaves fall? Yes. 5A or 5B hardiness. No. Yeah, just wait until... The best time is probably like November, October. I mean, excuse me, November, December, February, March. I do my grapes in February. I'll do the apple trees in... November, December. When they're dormant, I mean, part of that is also you just want the wood to be cold so that they're uh, they're, they're snappier. Jimmy Hat, a while back, you made the best point about Jimmy Dore. He doesn't accept the reality of impacts of accelerationist plans. I would have more respect for his ideas if he acknowledged the downside. Diana Roche would love it if you get Sarah Silverman on to talk about her new Hulu show. I just asked her that the other day. I don't know if she'll have time, but I saw the first episode. I thought it was great. Show was great. Kyle, the rational national is playing. Oh, this is the final I am of the day, folks. The Rational National is playing the long game here. Becoming a patron of the Michael Brooks show just to strengthen his argument that you and Jimmy Dore should be friends is chilling. That's fucking brilliant. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Seeing the truth in the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was made Option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive.